Welcome to What If I Don't Like It. I'm your host, Katie Balbasaro, and this episode we're talking with returning guest Rocky Calcetta about the 2019 horror mystery, Midsommar. Welcome to episode 18. And even though it is rounding on the end of summer, I wanted to do Midsommar. It's not the Midsummer, but that's still okay. Obviously, the reason I wanted to do Midsommar is because our returning guest, Rocky Calcetta, who you might remember from episode four, Raiders of the Lost Ark, has decided to come back on and do another challenge, which is impressive. A lot of people who come back on the show want to challenge me, and and it's my turn to watch something that they like that I have been hesitant to watch. But no, Rocky, he's a good sport, and he came on to watch Midsommar. He really does not like Ari Aster. However, he loves horror movies, and he's only ever seen one Ari Aster movie. You'll have to listen to the episode to find out which one that is, although we tell you in the first part, so it's not super big weight, but I'm not going to tell you right now. I am going to do a little bit of quick housekeeping, of course, at the top, as I always do. Last month, I did two really awesome episodes of Movie Night Extravaganza. They were super, super lovely and had me come on as a guest co-host to talk about Lord of the Rings, along with other awesome guests. Guests, especially on the first one, that are more qualified than me to talk about this, because on the first episode I did with them, they had Mike Morosky. He was the head of Massive for while he was there. He worked on all three of the trilogies. Uh, So special effects guy, really awesome. Also a very accomplished musician and good friend of Conan Neutron on the show. That episode, I, I lagged a little bit. My computer was having technical difficulties, but the rest of the crew, obviously more than qualified to hold the conversation while I bumble in the background. Um, I'm exaggerating. It was great. It was wonderful. It was such an amazing conversation to get to sit there and talk with Mike, who is telling us stories like, oh yeah, when I was directing Vigo, like, ooh, first-hand accounts, super, super fun. You got to go check it out. Liner Notes will have that. And then also, Lauren Swinard, who was on an episode here, which you might remember, the Eli Roth episode, super fantastic episode. Really, really fun to listen to, to get to talk to another woman about why she's hesitant about horror and everything that went into that. That wound up being such a deliciously fantastic episode. Definitely check that out as well. Super fan for Lord of the Rings. Like, I love Lord of the Rings. Girl will put us all to shame with her fantastic knowledge, and she she does. She does a great job of being on the episode. Had to cut out early, but just graced us with an amazing amount of presence for the first bit. Also in the liner notes, so if you're a big Lord of the Rings fan and you're looking for a reason to digest tons of more geeky nerdery on it, uh, we have that content for you. I was also on an episode of Trash Wire with Alexis Gentry, who is going to be on our next episode, episode 19, because she is hesitant to watch modern horror or horror, so we're going to keep doing our modern horror theme, and we're going to talk about It Follows, which is a film that I really, really like, and if you're a fan of Carpenter, you get to see how that gets kind of interpreted into a new vision for a more modern audience. But we'll talk about that then. I went on her show to talk about the history of the MPAA and the rating system. As I say on that show, if you want to know more about the Hays Code, which was the censorship code prior to the MPAA rating system, do go on TikTok and follow lobby intros. That's Harry at Intro in the Lobbies. He does a fantastic, what he called, you series, and I fucking love that term, about the existence of the Hays Code, how it came to be, why it came to be, everything and more. Can't recommend following him enough. So knowledgeable, and the way that he puts information forward, it's just really digestible, really fascinating stuff. So do check him out. But Alexis and I talked about the rating system, what it means in a modern society, how it came to be, and some really interesting facts. I also tell her a story about the first time anyone ever stopped me from watching a film because they felt that it was 
too adult for me to watch, which was strange in my family because we really didn't we really didn't do that. And in telling that story on that show, it prompted a guest for a following episode of this show, which will come on probably later. I don't know, September, October, we're gonna work on scheduling because I didn't realize my sister was also present for that key moment, which was burned into both of our minds. Uh, <laughs> they definitely deeply and distinctly remember the entire scenario. But if you want to find out what it was and what movie it was, you'll have to go to the liner notes and you'll have to listen to that episode. It's only like 30, 40 minutes long where I talk to Alexis on her show. Subscribe, follow it. It's a fantastic show about that movie and what we experienced. The reason I talk about it is because my sister, Kristen, will be coming on, as I alluded to, in the future because to date, neither of us have ever actually watched that movie. We still didn't. It was verboten forever, I suppose, but we're gonna try and watch it together and see what happens. But focusing in on this episode, like I said, we talk about Midsommar, we get into the very nitty gritty of this incredibly dense and, you know, divisively long film, talk about whether or not we felt it was too long, long enough, you know, the whole Goldilocks scenario, the minutia of the folklore, everything in there, whether it was real, whether it wasn't, how that affects us, the idea of xenophobia in horror movies, and the idea of maybe that being okay, because can you dislike a way of living that's not yours if that way of living is killing unwilling people? Or are you being racist. <laughs> Traditions may be weird, then where do you draw your line around that? We also talk about something that I find to be very, very fascinating, and I keep finding in more and more films, the idea of what is a happy ending for the character itself versus a happy ending for the audience. So little teasers for what you can expect as we dive on in. Well, we think of life like the seasons. So you're a child until you're 18, and that's spring. And then at some point, we all do our pilgrimage, which is between 18 and 36, and that's summer. And then from uh, 36 to 54, we're a working age, which is fall. And then finally, from 54 to 72, you become a mentor. What happens at 72? <laughs> Welcome to episode 18. We are back with another guest from the beginning of our series. This time, we've got Rocky Calcetta coming on to do another challenge. There's only one other guest who's done a challenge twice, Arielle Faye Folds. So good on you. Most people come back and they're like, Katie, now it's your turn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I, I did. I did actually think about that. I was like, man, I, I really got to have KT something to like to watch. And I was just going to make you watch The Witch again. <laughs> and I keep dodging that bullet being like, the, the conceit of the show is that the person has never <laughs> seen the movie. You can make yeah, me watch cool. something else by that director. Maybe maybe catch me that way. For people who don't know, Rocky very much likes The Witch, and I do not care for The Witch very much. <laughs> I love the way you pronounce it. So <laughs> I also weird. call that other show Mathrigan. The, the one with the little girl. <laughs> oh, right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm not too surprised you don't like it because a lot of people don't like the movie. Yeah. And I'm like, and I did. And then a lot of people liked Lighthouse and I did not. Mm -hmm. I actually haven't seen it yet because I'm scared. I've, I'm scared it's going to be too much like Vivich and I can't, I'm like, I don't know, got burned, but I, I'll watch it. I, I should probably take the chance. I mean, Willem Dafoe automatically elevates anything at, mm -hmm. at least a few times, you know, so. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is certainly very Willem Dafoe in that movie, which I enjoyed. And I also like Robert Pattinson. I just, I, I couldn't hang with the movie. It just got annoying, you know. Yeah. Like the worst parts of a Darren Aronofsky movie mm. was like that whole, that entire movie was just, was just that, so. Yeah, so this is kind of what... I think cinema is moving into a direction where there are a lot of 
psychological thriller drama kind of movies that don't totally fit into the horror genre because people have a very specific idea of what they think the horror genre is but i do think that psychological thrillers are part of that yeah. where it's more what, what the children are calling vibes where you're yeah, like yeah. So in that story didn't make a lick of fucking sense. What was going on with any of the characters? And they're like, it didn't matter because I felt uncomfortable. And that's what the movie is about. Yeah, I will. I will say that the probably the best horror movie ever is Requiem for a Dream. Preach. I'll, like, I'll fight to the death over that, too, because that movie scared me more than anything has ever scared me before. So the refrigerator, like just that alone. My question follow up. Have you seen Perfect Blue? I have not actually. Um, I uh, it's on my list of things to see. Yeah. And everybody keeps saying that like he directly lifted everything from that. So it's upset. It it's upsetting, Rocky. It is upsetting. Yeah. I saw Requiem for a Dream. Still love it. Still absolutely love it. Saw mm -hmm. Perfect Blue, but you will notice that Perfect Blue is the number one film on my top four lists because it is better. It, it yeah. takes what. And it goes in a different direction. They are two different themed films in my mind. I mean, obviously, I did that whole talk about how legally you can tell that he absolutely stole it from him. But they're both wonderful films. And I, I don't want to say, like, you can only like one. It's kind of like if you found out you really liked a flavor of gum and then somebody's like, hey, they make that flavor plus extra. Like, you now have another movie you could watch that you probably will really like. Yeah. I mean, it's like... I guess it goes along with the, the conversation of what's a homage and what's just stealing. I mean, yeah, that's a line. That is a line. Yeah. I mean, like certainly a lot of directors do that. I think Zack Snyder has tried to remake seven samurai like three or four times now. And it's like, please stop. But <laughs> you know, I, um, but even like, you know, Quentin Tarantino, like even like a lot of his stuff is just like, mm -hmm just basically taking a movie and you're just adding things to it. For me, my big thing with Tarantino, why I often want to say it's homage is that he is very upfront. He'll make a movie, he'll come out and he'll be like, this is my homage to this exact movie by this exact director who I highly yeah, recommend yeah. you see. Yeah. Whereas like to this day, Aronofsky is still like, nah, it wasn't perfect blue. And you're like, it fucking, you can put them it together was, and was. shot for shot. They do go in different directions because one is talking about the mental spiral of fame and the other right. one has got a lot other commentary going on yeah i mean it's fair like but i mean i i've noticed it a lot in um in film in recent films and like i i wish i could think of examples right now but a lot of plots are like plots that are very similar to like early episodes of twilight zone mm -hmm. or like or I think there was even like a popular horror movie and I can't remember which one that was like the entire plot of uh, one of the, are you afraid of the dark episodes? <gasps> I hate when they do that because I'm a big fan of that show. Yeah. I love that show too. And like that, it, it's like, it seems like we're not like, we're not creating new things mm -hmm. and it seems like we're just kind of like rehashing old things, which is, I mean, it's fine. There's, there's a place for that. And obviously, mm -hmm. Even stories that we told orally over the years have changed and, and become something else. But mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it feels cheap when it's movies for some reason. I, yeah. And sometimes there's a movie that does that, that does very well and is very blatant about it. But also it's like, I don't know. Like I always I always think of Bridget Jones's diary, which is just a retelling of uh, Sense and Sensibility. And they're yeah. pretty like the guy's name is still Mr. Darcy. So they're pretty yeah. obvious about it. And you're like, okay, there are certain things that you can uh, reskin, if you will. Like right. if it's a graphic user interface, just update it for the newest OS. But again, you have to be pretty honest about what you're doing. And it's it's more like people are seeing these episodic Monster of the Week shows and they have premises. Premises that were good for 30 to 45 minutes of television. And now yeah. they're like, oh, if we gave it more of a budget and we forced six different writers to write this for pennies, could we? No, you can't. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I felt the same way about uh, Lights Out. I loved the short film. I thought it was uh, like absolutely amazing. And the second they turned it into a feature length film, I'm like, why? Why? Like, I, I watched it. I mean, I, I didn't like any, really any part of it, but. Mm -hmm. 
concept. Just like, why would you stretch this out into into this feature length film when you had like just a perfect six minute film? Yes, it is very interesting. Almost every single person I talk to about making short films is just like, so are you going to take Girl in the Basement and make it into a full length film? And I'm like, it is a full film already. That is the story. And they're like, yeah, but you could stretch it. And I'm like, I don't want to. Why would I? There's nothing left to tell there except to expand on stuff that I don't feel like it needs to be expanded on. Just to um, just add an extra half an hour of like shots of the egg still cooking. (laughs) Yes, yes. That actually brings me to we're here to talk about Midsommar, and uh, it's got two different versions of it. It's got the version that went out in theaters, and then there is a version that is 23 minutes longer. The reason being that when Ari Aster went to the MPAA with his film, they said that the cut that he wanted was an NC-17, which is like a death kiss. Nobody's going to, you can't do that. Yeah. They're in the theaters. Yeah. Some theaters won't even play it. You might get protests. Uh, You know, I recently found out in Tennessee that it is a state law to enforce the restrictions on films that have ages like that. So, with an NC-17, with an R, I'm not allowed to let anybody under 18, they raise it in the state of Tennessee, in without yep. their guardian. So if you're 18 dating a 17-year-old, tough shit. You can't come in. Yep. But NC-17, if I let anybody under the age into that, it's a fucking misdemeanor. Yeah. So you don't want NC-17. Yeah, I mean, that's... um. I've definitely heard like stories about it. Like uh, even with like one of Rob Zombie's films was mm-hmm. going to be NC. I think House of a Thousand Corpses was going to be NC seventeen. That makes sense. Couldn't get it played. Um, yeah. And then he uh, then he continued his career and shouldn't. Have. <laughs> I will. I keep accidentally saying that I was in the Devil's Rejects instead of the Devil's Nightmare, and yeah. it's fun to see the people go, "Oh, yeah. and I'm like, no. No, not that not movie, that. which, not you know, movie. was pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. That does kind of, I mean, I guess, draw into this. Um, like, I have a problem with, like, a lot of, ho- like, modern horror movies. I, mm-hmm. I really, I'm a big horror fan, but, like, I just cannot get into, like, 99% of it. And, like, I found the problem is, like, either it's just, like, very art house feeling. Mm-hmm. Or like there's just no direction to it or it's very amateur where it's just like mm. like bare breasts and blood and you think that's a good movie you know and like certainly that director of that that film that you just mentioned leans in the ladder you know and i i just i i really can't get into them at all and it's 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 um it's like people watch trauma films and they're like this is how i want to like this is how I want my whole career trajectory to be. And it's like, whereas I can watch a trauma film and I can enjoy it for just being silly and stupid, mm-hmm. but at no point would I want to recreate that. Yeah. That's a really interesting subgenre that, I mean, I guess maybe one day we'll do an episode on it, but it's very hard for me to find good things to say about. I mean, sometimes it tries to very farcically look at things that are happening in our like sociopolitical world, but also like, Ooh, that's a hard sit through. And then to think that a lot of budget and time went into that. I also want to put out there a caveat for the audience that when you say you're not really into modern horror, that does hit because you are someone who did special effects for horror movies, who loves, right. like wanted to make horror movies and you find right. the current state of them upsetting. Yeah. I mean, for sure. And I, I, I don't know how much of that is just like uh rose colored glasses you know like mm. i was born in the 80s i grew up in like you know early 90s where like a lot of these horror films that that i grew up on are, are just like such classics now mm-hmm. that it's hard for me to take the take those glasses off and like be, accept more horror films but mm-hmm. i mean even like modern slashers like i can't get into you know and i love i love the original halloween mm-hmm. um you know, the, the original Friday the 13th, even some of the mm-hmm. bad ones. Mm-hmm. And like Nightmare on Elm Street. Like, so. And now you have to deal with the fact that if you're talking about classic slashers, yeah. Scream. Scream. Scream is a classic classic. You don't have to have that conversation. Yep. Um, there was a, God, I don't remember the name of it. What was the Wes Craven movie that he made that was just after Scream, but was just absolutely terrible. Ooh. Where it's like 
10 kids that were like fated to, to die together or something like that. I'm just going to kill me. I'm going to have to look it up. Uh, well, either, I mean, like even, even Wes Craven, like, you know, if he fumbles and I guess I'm just very right. critical of, of horror movies for not, I don't know, living up to my standards, I guess. But yeah, I definitely think it's, it's, it's part rose colored glasses. Cause when I look back at films, horror films from what considered the classic birth of American horror, say the seventies and eighties, when we really start hitting the, the, uh, you know, genre hard and, not all of them are great. And no. they were, you know, definite testaments to their budgets. Last House on the Left, the original, should yeah. have a low budget and should be the way that it is for the commentary that it's making. It wasn't meant to be like, let's make these kills better. It was more about what does it mean to have killed these characters. And I feel mm -hmm. like once we start to give more money to horror movies, which is what happens kind of in the 2000s and where we are now, big budget horror movies, there is a breath of pretension that doesn't meet to the art it, it feels so like fart in your hand and smell it yeah i um i i find myself like a lot of times like thinking about movies that i see that are are not good mm -hmm. i guess so we'll say um and I, I think about the fact that somebody wrote it mm -hmm. another person read it and then like more people were like yes let's definitely make this mm-hmm and I'm like, how, like, where's the disconnect there where people are like, this was a good idea to make this film. Mm -hmm. I feel that way, even like with non horror genre movies. Of but course. Oh yeah. It's like, course. but ultimately it comes down to like, you want to tell a story and you want people to hear the story, but why, why do you want people to hear the story? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I felt that way with like 50 shades of gray. Like why, why did we need to hear the story? Money, definitely money. That's a fan oh, yeah. pick that they could flock money out of. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, I felt that way seeing a couple short films over the summer. Mm -hmm. um, at a festival. Mm. I was like, why did why did this happen? You know, so yeah, and this it takes so much time to even make five minutes of film can take multiple right. take like two days. I was uh, yeah. reading yesterday that the world's largest scene with extras. 300,000 extras to do the funeral scene for Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Day and a half, 11 cameras, 20 miles of film. It's in 126 seconds of the film. Yeah. That's how, fuck, it takes so yeah. much to get Basically, nothing. Yeah. It's just, I, I, I mean, these, I got to meet these people that make these films. They're, they must be incredibly charismatic to get people to be like, yeah, that's great. Let's do that. Let's do but, it. Here's oh, some the, the Wes Craven movie is My Soul to Take. Wow, I had never even heard of it. That's how good it is. Yeah. Oh, it is. It is hor I I watched maybe 10 minutes of it and I shut it off and I'm like, oh, man. So. Yep. Yeah, but, you know, I'm, at the same time, movies that are classic from earlier horror, like, say, Monkey Shines. That's right. not a good movie, but it is fun to watch. So you get right. into this weird place where horror starts to think. I can get away with being bad if it's funny. And that right. is a really hard line to, to fall on. In fact, Midsommar, which is set in Sweden, when mm. it played in Sweden, vastly panned. Everyone thought it was just a straight black comedy. The audiences were laughing their asses off. Yeah. That's kind of like uh, when... Um... Eli Roth went down to South America and he showed a, a tribe, the original cannibal Holocaust. Mm -hmm. they thought that yeah. actually got them in on it. They're like, we're shooting this shit. This is so funny, man. Yeah. I thought that was, I love that fact. I, and that's a, that's a divisive. I feel like that and this movie incredibly divisive in the film community. If you want to talk about movies that you either fucking loved or fucking hated, Ari Aster is a wonderful director for you either are on board or you want to you want to find someone who was on board and yell at them, which is weird. I don't think there's very many other genres where the fans are that like they'll attack each other for liking or disliking something. Oh, no, I mean, Star Wars for sure. But... Oh, well, yeah, those people are <laughs> called incels and they're not <laughs> they don't get to have their own fan. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, that's I mean, for sure. But. I mean, and I can I can think too because like I did like Green Inferno. Um, I did mm -hmm. like the Hostel films, mm -hmm. and like they're not good films.
films, you know, like I know that. And Mm -hmm. I like, I still enjoy it because it's something different or like with green Inferno, it's at least something like, I love the original cannibal Holocaust, like Mm -hmm. growing up. I don't, I I can't really say that I can stomach or watch it now. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's still like holds a special place for me. Yeah. And, and Eli Roth, for as much as you disagree with him, I feel like he has a vision and he's telling a little story. Right. And I, I do love like just the, the allegory for, you know, just dumb Americans traveling abroad. That's, and I obviously that was in hostile as well. So well, I mean, yeah. And it yeah. constantly gets misunderstood where people are still just like, no, you don't understand. We need to save that tribe from people like you. And you're like, did you watch? You obviously didn't watch the yeah, movie, yeah. but that's fine. Just leave them alone. You know, that's it. That's, that's all you got to do. Let the world do its thing, you know? Yeah. So before we get too much into Midsommar, I would love to get a litmus on things that you do like so that we can kind of know where we're coming from here. Let's do your, what I'm calling Letterbox top four, but it doesn't have to be off of Letterbox. What are your top yeah. four movies? And I will have been allowing for a fifth honorable mention. All right. I mean, it's, it's probably as like someone is just like, oh yeah, I love horror so much. It's probably going to seem like a strange list, but Fuck um, it. number one. I think my number one is Young Frankenstein. Oh um, my God! What a wonderful, wonderful choice. I mean, it's just like it's just a perfect film, and it's a film that I can watch a million times over and over again, and I'll never get sick of it. Did so, you Did you watch the Gene Wilder documentary? I haven't yet. No, you no. should. It talks you know about the making of that film, and there's a lot of interesting and fun facts. No kidding. Yeah, I'll have to do it for sure. Um, <laughs> So, and then in line with that, um, and number two would be Spaceballs. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I can, I can honestly, I can recite that entire movie to you right now. Like, That's wonderful. For, like, no problem. Like, I watch that movie all grown up, and it's just, like, another classic I'll never get tired of. So, Did you get to see that in theaters when you were a kid? I don't have the exact day that No, it no, but I did, I did get to when I was an adult. I saw it in theaters. It, it came back, so. That's great. Um, oh, have you seen... Ice Pirates? No, I haven't seen Ice Pirates. It is, um, it's like if somebody got, somebody saw Spaceballs and then told someone else about it, and then the person they told wrote a movie. <laughs> I'll have to look it up. I don't think I've even, I, I, it sounds familiar, but I don't know that I've seen anything about it at all, so. It was our episode, uh, I did an episode recently with Scott about it. Um, it didn't hold up for either of us, but there's some fun facts. It's written by the same person who wrote Krull. Okay, yeah. I mean, Krull, I love Krull the Conqueror, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, they changed the script yeah. a lot on the poor guy, so it's not his fault. Yeah. His weapon, though, I mean, it was just amazing. It's so cool! Yeah, I don't even care if weapons from sci-fi movies make no sense and there's, like, no way to hold them. In fact, I have right. behind me... It's a Klingon dagger. And like, how do you stab someone without stabbing yourself back? I don't <laughs> yeah. know, but it's so cool. It looks cool. That's all, that's all that matters, you know. <laughs> but Spaceballs is a wonderful... Oh, God. What's your favorite scene from Spaceballs? Um, oof, that, that is a rough one. I constantly, um, when we're playing d and D, I will I will constantly, like, uh, do the scene where he's playing with the dolls. Ah! So what are you doing? Same thing I'm going to do to you, big boy. And then like, I'll knock over people's minis, but I mean, so I love that one, but I think my, my favorite would be the, uh, the one where they put on, they put on space balls and he's like, I don't get it. When does this happen in a movie now, sir? Everything you see now is happening now. What happened to then? Missed it. When, you know, like, yeah. I love that scene so, so much. And it's, it's not even that funny, but it's, it's just hilarious to me. The patois and the cadence of the humor in a Mel Brooks movie is such that I, I feel like you can watch it 10, 20 times and still be picking up on new jokes each time. And as you get older, you, you understand more jokes. Like There's an incredibly high rewatch on, on pretty much all of the stuff that he's done. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes like the jokes come out like so rapid fire that like you don't you don't pick up on it. It's the same way with a uh, with like Naked Gun or Airplane. Um, I love that shit. I love that obtuse yeah. humor so fucking much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is so good. But um, so, yeah, I mean, after Spaceballs, um, I love the movie uh, Perfume Story of a Murderer. 
Oh yeah, um, I have that on DVD. That's a that's a little bit of an obscure one. Yeah, I mean it's my favorite book, um, and I, I just the movie did did the book very well. Mm-hmm. Um, the the director unfortunately also made Cloud Atlas. So <laughs> we'll forget. We'll yeah, you can, you can forgive him that. But uh, but no, it is one of my favorite stories, and I was very excited when they made it into a film, and. It's a book that I, I constantly go back to um, over and over again. So, yeah, great performance by Hoffman in a, in a less yeah. than expected role. Oh yeah, absolutely for sure. And um, the uh, the guy there from Beetlejuice that. Oh my God! Yeah, the fat guy. He's yeah. well. He well. He got fat. He was in Ravenous. Now he's thin. We'll throw his name in the the thing at the end. We shouldn't right. though, because he's now a convicted child molester. So. Oh, so then I'll throw his name in so that you know he's now on the list yeah. of child. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I guess that's yeah. why he's not acting anymore. Oh, well. Kevin, Kevin Spacey, though. As long as they don't convict you, you can keep acting. Oh, yeah. Oh, or you can just go on TV and cry about it, you know? Um, <laughs> I think my, my last one, I mean, this one I feel like is has got to be obvious for the time period I was born, but Princess Bride. Oh, thank God. Talk about movies I can quote. I mean, you're talking to a fencer. We got to watch it once a year. I yeah. And the fencing in that is accurate. It's good. The things that they say when they talk about Tybalt's circle, like that is actual fencing yep. lore. Yeah, I remember you uh, talking about that too, actually. God. Favorite scene from that? Um, Wow, that's a good question. I, I love, uh, I get emotional. When uh, Inigo Montoya finally like catches up with the sequel, like I, I actually still even I watched it a couple of weeks ago and I got like teary eyed in that part because it's like, you know, it's just like so much passion like mm-hmm. still falling through him even after years and mm-hmm. and like finally he's just finally he's found this man and then like he just gets up from being stabbed in the liver and yeah I do love that part. I do love that. And it's Mandy Patinkin almost disappearing into the role. I constantly forget that that's him. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I, and it, it's weird because um, I was a fan of Dead Like Me. Um, mm-hmm, me show. too, yeah. He was, he was in that. And like I watched that show for years before I realized that was him. Oh, it's because he doesn't look like the guy from the movie. No. Oh, he doesn't at all. But I mean, also, this is many, many, many years ago. So yeah. And I, I saw that actually um, near us, they're having a viewing of The Princess Bride with Carrie Ellis. Um, oh. Like one of the, I think the tickets were like 90 bucks or something. I was really mm. considering getting it. But. You, that, Carrie Ellis is the one from the, if you're going to see somebody, Robin Wright or Carrie Ellis, of course, also yeah. um, uh, Billy Crystal. But oh, yeah, uh, sure. Mandy Patinkin is apparently a, a, a pain in the ass in real life. So maybe skip if he's is there. He? <laughs> yeah, he's incredibly I, difficult to work with. And that's part of the reason why he was written off of Criminal Minds. Huh. That's, uh, yeah, I don't think I ever heard that. Yeah, he's a, he's a little bit of a diva. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, he is an ego Montoya. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah my, right. my favorite scene from that is is the... Uh, to to love scene with uh, oh, Billy Crystal and his wife. Yeah, to <laughs> yeah. Uh Miracle Maxine is so great. And uh what's her name? Um is it Carol Kane? Yeah. Yeah. She's like, You liar. I love her, I, I so, love her so much. much and everything. Carol Kane is a highlight in his work. Yeah, she's such an amazing actress. But Billy Crystal, like I, I hear that like on set they actually had to um film behind actors or or throw them off set completely because Billy Crystal was so hilarious that like they just could not stop laughing. Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. If you when you watch that Gene Wilder documentary, which is on Netflix, definitely recommend, they Mel Brooks bought every single person on the set of Young Frankenstein a white kerchief, like a handkerchief. And they were instructed to keep it on them at all times. So that if they were going to start laughing, they could shove the damn thing in their mouth and bite down. And he talks about multiple scenes, especially with um, Cloris Leachman. Oh yeah, Cloris Leachman. Where you would look, yeah, you would look around, and every single the guy with the boom mic, every single camera person is just biting a white kerchief just stir, to get through because it's so fucking funny. Yeah, I mean, I I love Marty Feldman too. So oh my he's just. God. He's a, he's such an amazing comedic person, and like it works for him that he just looks funny, you know. Like mm-hmm. 
So it's it's hard to take him seriously. Yeah, and his timing is great. I found out the other day there's a movie called The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes' um, Smarter Brother. Yes, that they talk about this in the documentary. I I didn't know that it existed honestly, mm-hmm. and I I'm I'm so excited to actually finally see it, but it's not streaming anywhere. Oh no! So I have to order I have to order a DVD from Amazon, oh. like a a surf or something, you know. Jesus Christ! Yeah, yeah they make you bicycle the whole time to play the machine that plays it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, because I didn't know that they had another film that they were together, Gene Wilder and Marty Feldman. So. Yeah, I have uh, yeah. I saw it. Maybe when I was like 17, 16, I guess forever ago, uh, my yeah. dad is a big Gene Wilder fan. And so like we saw all of that. Um, also big Danny Kay fan. I feel like those two guys kind of go together. Yeah. As, as far as honorable mentions go, I, I'm a heterosexual white male. I I, I love Fight Club. So. <laughs> it's a Czech Polonic book. I feel like it's uh, trendy to hate on Fight Club if you want to, but like... Honestly, if you lived during the time period when Fight Club came out and you saw Fight Club then, it was astonishing. That movie got made, that that story was told, that was so di- yep. diversive, so like, ah! Oh! Yep. So, you know, now it seems milk toast, but go fuck yourselves. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I love David Fincher as a director, so, I mean, like, all his Me stuff I, I've always loved. Like, Seven um, mm-hmm. was the alien movie he did, Res- Resurrection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was four, which I think is Jezre. No, four was Jeannot. Oh, no, we'll fix it at the end or I'll just cut it out. (laughs) (laughs) That's fine. So, I mean, yeah, I love David Fincher as a director. So it's just uh, I I, so I love that movie. I love the things that are hidden in that movie. And I Mm -hmm. I enjoy like rewatching it and like noticing things I didn't notice before. And now that it's like now that we have like TikTok and, and YouTube and all that, like all those things have been found and I've seen them a million times. So it's, it's not as exciting, but, but you know, I still, there are still things that I'll see where people will be like now noticed for the first time ever in this game or this, you know, like, yeah, yeah. keep putting yourself out there for that. I guess my follow-up question would be, what is your favorite horror movie? If you could pick one favorite horror movie that came out most recently, since we're talking about modern horror. So most recently, um, it follows. Oh, yeah. Good choice. Good choice. Yeah, I mean, that one I really enjoyed. Um, I have really enjoyed um, this Ty West trilogy mm-hmm. um, with X and Maxine. And, and Pearl. Uh, I haven't seen Maxine yet and, and Pearl. Um, I love mm-hmm. Ty West. I love the Innkeepers. Uh-huh. Um, and I did like some of the work in, in VHS. I wasn't a big fan of all of the films. but I mean, know. there's a lot of different films in there. I don't think you could yeah. possibly be a fan of everything in that. There's there's too much too much yeah. difference. Um, what did you? What do you like about the, those trilogies? Like, what are the aspects of the films that really resonate with you? This, as opposed to say other modern horror. I I just think that it's like it's it's aloof enough that it's like comedic, okay. but in like in, okay. and not like a like it's trying too hard kind of way. Um, mm-hmm. I enjoyed that X was very. Um, they had like like meta commentary within it, you know. Like you get through the first mm-hmm. 20 minutes of the film and then um, the actor says, all right, let's show these folks what they came here to see. And then immediately it's like, it's them filming like the, the pornographic scenes. So it's like, it, it's just funny in that way that it's like kind of like tongue in cheek, but then they're just mm-hmm. like completely unhinged um, in, in, in that way. Like who would think to have like a, an old woman be like the, the villain of a slasher movie. Breaking uh, tropes and standards is usually refreshing right? yeah and it was just like her need to be desired as a woman and you know here she is she's like 80 90 years old and like i don't know it's just like it's such a interesting take on a slasher genre that that i enjoyed it and like i said it did have its humorous moments i'm also um i'm a big fan of mia goth so i mean it's just kind of goes without saying mm-hmm. really so i enjoyed her and i like infinity pool as well so i mean i was just mm-hmm. i'm I'm all, I'm all, I'm here for Mia Goth for sure. And that that one that not everyone totally liked, but again, I think the saving grace on that was everyone agreed that Mia Goth's performance was worth it. I think what we're seeing now in modern horror is a, a like a kind of callback to Final Girls or movies where you can sell a horror movie based on your lead heroine. You've got Mia Goth. You've got. Um, 
Micah Monroe, the chick from It Follows, who's now in Long Legs as well, who was astounding in It Follows. And I really loved the idea of uh, taking an STD and, and making it like, what if it was a horror? What if that was part of the whole? And it does a really good job of what people call slow burn. I know that slow burn often gets put onto things nowadays that take forever to end, but have a good ending. Uh, how do you feel about slow burn? Oh, so, yeah, I mean, so I, this was something I wanted to talk about as a criticism of um, hereditary. Mm. Um, a lot of people said that like, oh, you know, it's a slow burn film, but I think like people are just using slow burn as um, bad pacing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like uh, it, didn't edit it. Yeah. Like you just didn't pace the film well. So it's, it's not a slow burn. It's just, it's a boring film. You know? Yeah. That, that resolves well enough for you to be like, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, for sure. So like with hereditary, all the elements were there for this to be a great film. But I was just, mm -hmm. I was so bored by it. It was just like, um, just these long shots that just not need to exist. And, and like, you're, mm -hmm. it, I don't know, like, it, it, you didn't make things cohesive, you know, like, I had to watch for two hours straight before I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense, you know, like, mm. at least tie some of that back at, at all. I mean, like, with Hereditary, like, the the puppet allegory was at least wonderful. It was great, like the little, mm -hmm. the little, yeah. the little dollhouse, and like where people are controlling these people in this in this bigger house. And like, it's, that's awesome. Um, I love the performances in it. I love the idea of like a of a cult, you know, like that's controlling things and manipulating people from behind the scenes. Like, but like you put it into this film that I'm just like uh, falling asleep during it. You know, like I don't need everything to be fast pace, but I I would like some pace to it. Yeah, and it's another case of big topic. If you step back and you look at like, what is the ultimate story of Hereditary? Or what is it trying to tell? Yeah, I think Ari Aster often starts with a script where he's like, I want, I want to take something that is a human emotion I find horrific and make a horror movie around that, mm -hmm. which is where if we go back to our beginning of our conversation, we both believe that Requiem for a Dream is a really good horror movie right. because it approaches things that exist in our real life that are horrific. That doesn't need to be Satan coming to get me because there's plenty of shit on earth that's already coming to get me. Yeah. And I like that about him. I think even in the same vein, though, like um, one of my favorite horror movies, like earlier when you asked, like, what's my favorite horror movie? My favorite horror movie of all time is Rosemary's Baby. Mm. Rosemary's Baby had a, a big yes. statement to make and like it was told in such a way that like it was it, it stayed interesting the entire time and like afterward it made you think about it like you know like it, it made you consider a woman's right to choose mm -hmm. if if like the situation is is kind of opposite than how we look at it you know like um mm -hmm. you know we think about people having like abortions like cut off um potential for for someone to be a great person but like this person this baby about to be born is satan so it's like yeah. you know would you defend it at, at that point and that's that's one thing i love about a lot of horror films is that they they make you question things in life and they make you kind of reflect on it or reflect on why you're afraid of things you know mm -hmm. even as, as as cheesy as a nightmare on elm street had gotten i mean the idea of like people being able to die in their sleep, you know, it's just like, it's, it's, it's scary. And it's like, it's scary to, to be like, I can fall asleep right now and something can happen to me. That's so horrific inside my own head that I could, I could perish. You know, it makes you scared to do the things that like you normally do in life and it makes you question those things. So. Yeah. It makes me think of silent Hill, the first uh, series of silent, silent Hill game where you're not given a weapon, you're given a flashlight. Mm -hmm. And you're not supposed to kill the things that approach you. You're supposed to successfully avoid them. Yeah. And it's like, oh, we're not, we're not really trained for that. That's really scary to be so vulnerable. Like this is my own dreams. I can't control any of this. It's, it's really, really good. My follow up for that is, how do you feel about say, um, immaculate? And I can't remember the name of the other first omen. How do you feel about the Immaculate and the First Omen, which are similar stories to Rosemary's Baby, but modern, modern horror? I 
I so I watched Immaculate uh, a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think Sydney Sweeney is a, is an incredibly talented actress. Yeah, yeah, another name for the big list. Yeah, she um, and I, especially in Euphoria, I think she's great. So I think that she was certainly on on top of her game in that film. The story was just a little like a little predictable and lacking. You know, like as soon as, mm-hmm. and I'm sorry for spoilers here, but as soon as the priest says that he was a former biologist, I was like, he's going to inseminate her. <laughs> so like, I knew where the story was going. I don't feel like that's a spoiler. If you're watching, you know, there's a baby in this movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but in, in line with spoilers, I like when movies go to a place that you don't think that they're going to go. And the end of Immaculate was certainly that. I was just like, Holy shit, they actually did the thing that I didn't think they were going to do. So, yeah, yeah, I'll give you like a whole extra star if you just do that. Yeah, yeah, and then, and then they did it and I'm like that's great. Um I didn't see the first omen, I just had no interest in it, so I just Whoa, but this what is that woman's name? Nell Free Tiger? Nell Tiger Free? Um she's truly a horrible actress. I, I absolutely hate her and that movie is terrible and it's really interesting because i feel like the exact reason why it is terrible is is exactly what is missing when you look at it compared to rosemary's baby which rosemary's baby is really talking about the allegory for like what if this isn't yeah satan like what if this is just a woman's right to choose about the baby the baby she has might not be the next greatest thing like it it just totally takes that out and is like let's focus on the religious thing and it's definitely Satan and like the next and it I feel like modern horror is missing the point a lot of the times for the bigger allegory and just kind of focusing on the like isn't this scary and yeah. cool? Yeah, I mean I feel the same way about horror films that are like isn't this shocking? And it's like no, I mean like I grew up I grew up watching Faces of Death. I've seen real people actually die. Like whatever you're doing in your film is not really going to shock me. You just write a good story and, you know, I'll forgive the, the things that you do in it, you know? Yeah. How do you feel about Serbian film? Oh, I, um, I, I hate that movie with, with a passion. Good. I think that it was, it was, it was beautifully shot. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I understand that it was shocking for the point of being shocking, but uh, it just didn't need to be made. And I, I'm not a big fan of, uh, um, what, what TikTokers call grape in, in film. I, um, I'm, I'm just not a fan of it in film. I don't think it really needs to be there ever. And, and certainly in Serbian film, what to involve a, an infant in that, like whether or not it's fake, it's just, shocking. Like, why did, yeah. Like, why did it have to be in there? And it, it was, it was there for no other reason than to be shocking. Um, but. Yeah, that is the I think the quintessential film for made to be shocking. Right. Uh, and ev- almost everyone agrees that that didn't work to get its message across um, and didn't didn't hit for pretty much anybody watching it. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, who actually um, suggested it to me was um, the actor in Human Centipede 2. That makes sense. I feel like that is someone who's like, look, if you hated Human Centipede 2, let me tell you about a way worse movie. <laughs> yeah, so I was outside at um he was he came to Rock and Shock and I was outside there and I was I was smoking and then Lawrence Harvey, the actor in Human Centipede 2, um mm-hmm. came out there to smoke as well and like we were talking about films and I was talking about how I didn't like the Human Centipede. Um and he was like, "Oh, you know, if you uh, you know, you want to see a, a good film that's that's kind of shocking, you should check out a Serbian film." And I was like, "Sure." So I did. And after seeing that film, I've been waiting for him to appear at another convention so I can punch him in the face because, oh, my God, like, why Why would you even like why? I think he punked you. I think you said I didn't like the yeah, movies you're in. Probably, he's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you. Go watch this movie. Yeah, son. <laughs> it's, it's like that movie. Um, uh, Sallow, you know, like. <laughs> I just I, I don't understand how some movies get made or or how hundreds of people jump on board and say yes let's make this. I will say sometimes you make a movie and they edit it after you've done making the movie after you've done acting your part yeah. and they change entirely what you were told the movie was about. 
And then people come and find you and they're like, why did you have this accent in this movie if it wasn't set in the South? And you're like, they told us it was set in the South while we were filming it. So I, I always have to remember, I've been done dirty in things I've been in. Someone asked me um, what the worst movie I'd ever seen was, and I felt obliged to answer a movie that I was in. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. I answered Killing Brooke. Yeah, and that is certainly on par for that that particular director. No, but if somebody came up to me and they were like, yo, I hated Killing Brooke, mm-hmm. I'd be like, oh, you know what? Me too. <laughs> You need to see horny teenagers must die. Yeah. That's that's the one. That's the one I was going to challenge you on and make you watch it. I, I, to this day, worry because people come on TikTok and they watch. Are you familiar with the platform Tubi? Yeah. I watch a lot of stuff on there. Yeah, there's a lot of horror on there. Yeah. It seems to let a lot of like new or lesser made budget horrors on there. So it's a crap shoot. Yeah. And I fear the day that one of those films gets on Tubi and I open up my TikTok and one of my friends is like, let me, I want to talk about, and I have to be like, look, I know it was a prosthetic penis. I know they bit it off. I have so like, oh God, I can't respond. I take no responsibility. Yeah. I don't know for sure. I mean, yeah, you were young and you needed the money, you know? I probably needed the money, didn't get paid. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> I needed the exposure. No, I mean, and that's that's certainly like so. A lot of my my contention comes from um, just being like doing the, the zombie swimsuit calendar and being at these these horror conventions and meeting these people and like connecting with these people and then like taking a look at the films that that people are making and I'm just like, why? Like, and I. I just, I mm-hmm. think that, that they have some kind of, uh, they're working through mental illness, like through their films or something, or like, they're just exacerbating it, you know? And it's just, mm-hmm. and so I can't get, I can't get into a lot of, uh, horror. And I, 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 to be honest, I don't watch a lot of horror now, unless like I hear something good about like long legs. I heard good things about it. Well, that segues really well into our conversation specifically about Midsommar yeah. because a lot of people tell me they hate Midsommar for being pretentious and uh, doesn't really go anywhere and it's a long, slow burn and it's annoying. And I feel that is very, very true of Long Legs. I feel like if you sit down with the script of Long Legs and you actually ask yourself questions as you might a script writer editing something, right. you literally you would have to red page every single page of that script. It is narratively a night nightmare. No. And because of that, I can't care about the acting. Although I will say that um, Micah Monroe, I always want to say Marika. That's why I like has it. Micah's performance is horrible. This horrible. It, it, she does this weird thing with her lip and it it's just very it's so much of what is done is done without any explanation but specifically heavily done yeah. and that for me always pisses me off when you think about midsommar which is a really big horror movie for the last oh god when yeah. did midsommar come out 2018 maybe yes 2018 yeah why didn't you? Why didn't you see it in theaters? Because Ari Aster. So what other pieces of, besides Heredity, what have you seen by him? Nothing. That Nothing. So that one movie was enough to be like, nah, son. That was it. I mean, I, um, what was he? Uh, he was a producer on something recently that I saw that I thought was pretty good. Um, yeah, he is getting involved in a lot of. Oh, oh dream, dream Scenario. He was producer on Dream Scenario. Which I really enjoyed. Yes. So um, that was a good one. I didn't. I had no interest in seeing um, Bo is Afraid. I love Walking Phoenix, but it just it seemed like one of those um, science of sleep films, or um, that or that movie with uh, Paul Giamatti, where his like soul is a like, tiny pea, and I don't. It just yeah, like one of those like really weird movies that just yeah are weird for no reason. Like I love Terry Gilliam, but. I, I, nobody can reproduce what he what he does. I will say this is the closest I've seen to Brazil, shy of network, right? Uh, in in Bo is Afraid, but I don't recommend that film to people because it is 
the closest simulation to having a panic attack I've ever seen on film. Yeah, I don't want to watch that. If I know you have panic attacks in your real life, you can just know that. Yeah. It is if you're a filmmaker or an actor, go see it because it's stunning what they managed to be able to do. But the end result is so bleh. and that's Ari Aster being like, OK, so anxiety and panic attacks are scary as fuck. Yeah. I want to make a movie that does that. And so that doesn't it doesn't always, always hit. I'm a huge fan of like Norse mythology and like I. That was my follow up. I mean, like, yeah, like, you know, yeah. like I. I read the poetic Eddas, you know, often, mm -hmm. and I'm a big fan of Vikings, like the television show. I love The Northman, um, the film with uh, Alexander Skarsgård. Um, I would, I'm a very heterosexual man, but Alexander Skarsgård, I would, I would absolutely, 100% love yeah. to cuddle him all night. Um, <laughs> he's such a, he's such an amazing actor too. So it's just, you know, but um, so like, and. Uh, like obviously I went to Iceland last year. I'm about to go to Iceland again in a week. Um, so, you know, I really, I, I love the mythology around that and all that. So Midsommar seems like it would be like right up my alley as far as it goes. Cause I like horror and I like Norse mythology. So, and so like, I am vaguely aware of what happens within the film, but just not in context. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. So, yeah. I mean the number, so I know that, you know, um, the, the sacrifices every nine years, in in um Uppsala, sweden were were a thing where um the number nine is like very important to um norse traditions you know like nine cycles of the moon nine months um for pregnancy and so like i know all the, like the the stuff around it i know vaguely that that midsummer has something to do with that but i don't know specifically how it plays out yeah, and this is specifically Scandinavian folklore. We're we're staying with Sweden, so it doesn't totally go into Norse right. uh, or say, say Viking stuff. But it is very accurate to the stuff that it is depicting, even though <laughs> it ironically wound up coming out in May in the United States, which is not yet midsummer. It's it's not the middle of summer, and in late August in Sweden. So it never wound up succeeding to come out at midsummer. Mm -hmm. um, but that you know, it's like um, it's like the Day of the Dead. I think a lot of different religions have a concept, or, or sorry, different cultures have a concept where right. there's a day that allows a thinning to happen between humans and supernatural beings, those who are dead, the afterlife, anything, whatever, mm -hmm. where you can kind of like connect with them. As it's, and it's usually specifically the end of like a harvest season. So mm -hmm. yeah, but I mean, yeah. So those traditions definitely carry across across continents. Yeah. So a lot of what you see in the film seem like it's taking a lot of extra time. Mm -hmm. Like, why is this scene here? If you don't know that, oh my God, so when you pick a flower crown for Midsommar, it needs to have seven or nine flowers because right. there's a, and like, even if you're, there's scenes where they put stuff in the background that are just drawings. Yep. That are like, oh, traditionally accurate drawings. So there's a lot of research that's gone on. And when I think about the misconnect between people who think this movie was too long and people who really enjoyed the length of the movie, it's the inability to care about the folklore aspect of the film. They don't need that buildup. They don't care about it. They want to get to the scary parts. Yeah, right. And so when I think about you, I know you're not that person. And I, I feel like... <laughs> There's a chance here you'll appreciate the moments when the movie is not trying to just be scary. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And I, I appreciate a good story. So your movie can be as long as, like, whatever. But if the mm -hmm. story is interested, and I'm happy to be there. I was that way with uh, with Dune 2. It's like, long movie. But I was happy yes. to be on that ride, you know? And I was totally, yeah. totally okay with it. So, um, I mean, even that way, like, I, I loved Ben-Hur. You know, like, I loved that film growing up. And Ten Commandments, I also loved. So it's like, mm -hmm. as long as I'm engaged the entire time, it's, the the length doesn't really bother me so much. Nice, nice. How do you feel about the lead actress, Florence Pugh? Um, I loved her in. Oh um, uh, God, why am I? Why am I always drawing a blank? Um, Oppenheimer. I yeah, she was stellar in that. Yeah, I thought she was amazing. I I know that I've seen her in other things, but I. That's like really the one that like I know that she was in. I didn't see uh, Black Widow or or whatever 
Marvel film that was. That's, she was that's the, yeah. was it Madam Web? No, that was no, that was Sydney Sweeney. It was Madam Web. Yeah, yeah, but no, I, I knew somebody who was a good actor got done dirty. Yeah. Not Dakota Johnson because she's not a good actor. Right. But <laughs> that's fair. That is okay. very fair. But no, I um, yeah, I thought she was like really wonderful in Oppenheimer. I saw that I think three mm-hmm. times in the theater. So also another movie that was really long that I, I didn't mind because I was you know because it uses its length well. Very, very you know, well. But I mean, that's that's my my trepidation here. Why I have not seen Midsommar yet is that it's a long movie, and Hereditary was just so so slow and dull that I just I couldn't keep interest in it. Yeah, that's. I think that's fair. And so I guess I want to ask you whether you intend to watch the director's cut or the regular cut. Twenty three minute difference. I think I would rather just watch the regular cut. Fair enough. The truth. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of director's yeah. cuts normally, but mm-hmm. I, I'm not sure that I'm going to like it. And if I like it, I'll, I'll definitely revisit the director's cut. So Absolutely. I think I'm going to watch the director's cut because I've already seen it, so yeah. I'll see it through. Um, it apparently, what it does is like deepen some of the relationships, uh, quote unquote. Yeah. The, the movie is a lot about grief. Um, as as like if we're talking about the other one was about anxiety, uh, this one's about how grief is kind of handled. Uh, how do you? Sometimes I know people who are like, look, there. I don't want to. I don't want to do that. I don't want to watch a movie that's like about being sad. I mean, I don't mind it because I think a lot of times other perspectives on grief certainly help mm-hmm. me and my own. Um, mm-hmm. So, and a lot of times, like watching movies helps me work through things that I have going on, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, um, it's cathartic in a way, you know, to, to yeah. things. but if it's done correctly, like, I mean, on, uh, like sitcoms, the way they work through grief is just like, just have a, a sad moment. And then like someone jumps in for a laugh, you know, and like it, that yeah. doesn't really work for me, but you know, like with movies, it's, it, it's interesting and it's interesting to see characters go through things that you, I've probably gone through it yourself and so mm-hmm. I don't mind I don't mind being sad. What I what I like about it is the way that it tries to approach that as we said earlier in a way that is not what you would normally think. It it so the number one reason people talk about Midsommar as being so impressive is that it is a horror movie shot entirely in daylight. Yeah, which I I can appreciate for sure, you know. Yeah, and so like it a lot of the the tools that it uses to make the message are opposite than the tools you would normally use. Like it doesn't need to get the the background track from a sitcom to let you know what is happening is sad. Right. It contextually does that. And sometimes even the visuals are playing the opposite of the emotion that the story is trying to say. And and I I find that f- very interesting. I, I like when a director is specifically choosing to do something as opposed to like just giving me some cool images. I mean, that might just be me. I do also like The Cell, even though that is considered just cool images. Oh, I, I, The Cell is like one of my favorite movies, honestly. And I, I love Tarzan Great. Singh as a director. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. I think he gets, mm, yeah, I think he gets misunderstood. Yeah, The Fall was such a great movie, and um, I think your your previous guest, Alex, mentioned that it was one of his favorites, and he was one of the only people I've ever heard of that actually liked that movie. So I have to see it still. I keep It's on my list, and I just keep forgetting that it exists, and then I go and watch a two-star fucking movie on Tubi like a loser. Yeah, I mean, I, I just watched uh, Class of Newcomb High like a couple nights ago, so I can't really on Tubi, so... <sighs> Uh, yep. So let let us not live in glass houses and throw stones. Yeah, for sure. As we uh, as we approach the end of this first part, I'm curious if there's anything that, I mean, you might like you said you have some context to some of the things that you know happens. What are scenes right. that you do know happens, and what are scenes that you're like afraid might happen, or that you're excited might happen that you don't know are in there? I really don't know much as far as scenes. I think at some point I, I read, I read or saw some videos of it, like maybe years ago. Um, so I had like these vague things in my head that you know, like might happen as far as like uh, killing goes. You know, like 
um, a lot of people talk about the gore and scenes or, or stuff like that. So, um, um, I, so I'm, I don't really have anything there other than just like, mm -hmm. I've avoided this movie. I just, I didn't like hereditary and I just kind of, I'm hoping that it makes me like Ari Aster a little more. I mean, I appreciate what he does and that it's different than what's, what's going out there. And I think that's really important that like original IPs can be created, mm -hmm. put out there. And like, I appreciate that he hasn't made a sequel to any of his movies yet. Yes. I, I enjoy that. Um, I, so I don't have any idea as far as like what's going to happen in the film. Um, I just know like vaguely, like it has to do with like uh, the sacrifices at Uppsala um, mm -hmm. and that there's a girl with uh, a flower, a flower crown that cries. I was going to say, you must know the scene with the, like, you, you couldn't have existed that Halloween yeah. without seeing tons of girls in that ridiculous outfit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so yeah, I mean, which is nice. I'm glad that I don't have much of That's an idea good. of what I'm getting into. Apparently, the the tradition that it depicts, uh, it's, how, it's Supa, how are you saying it? Uppsala. Uppsala, it's, a, it's effectively a myth? Um, I'm finding some interesting sources saying that there's a like 13th century saga that depicts it and everything like that, and this does a very good job of meeting that depiction. But uh, if if you, in case anybody listening to this is afraid of the, it didn't actually. There's no evidence that this ever really happened. So I think it was uh, in 1072, Adam of Brennan uh, wrote about it mm. um, happening. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure the authenticity of, of yeah. the writings and a lot of um, because Scandinavian Norse culture didn't actually have a written language. Most of what's written about it came years after when Christianity became a thing. So once the Christians um, became part of that, that community, that's when things started to be recorded and things started to be written down. So um mm -hmm. These could be things that the Christians made up just to, to further alienate them from their their belief system, or um, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, a lot of Christians were able to convert um, Vikings by saying that um, Ragnarok had already happened, and the outcome of that was Jesus. Ah! So, like, that's uh, <laughs> that's how they tricked them into into doing a lot of conversions, you know. So, damn, um, damn. So yeah, a lot of the writing that we get from just those old traditions is is fundamentally Christian um, mm -hmm. people that either interpret in something the wrong way or just like vaguely aware of a tradition or just using it as as essentially slander. So yeah, I think the you don't speak Swedish, right? No, no, I don't. The film does a really wonderful job of alienating the audience member. Mm -hmm. In, a, in in the right sort of way, which is that whenever somebody speaks Swedish, it is not subtitled. The, our characters don't speak Swedish, so you don't speak Swedish. You are feeling what that might feel like. Uh, I know that some people complain. They're like, Dude, and like, no, that is intentional from the director, as always. Yeah. Um, That's yeah. cool, like, I, I hate, I don't know if this ever happens to you when you're watching a movie and um, someone's speaking another language. And you know that they're now speaking another language, but the subtitle will say like speak in Mandarin. And that subtitle will go up over the actual English subtitle of what they're saying in the movie. <laughs> and like, so yep. like I constantly like missing missing stuff. So I uh I, I definitely appreciate it when they just like leave it out, you know, like let you just kind of because even um um Shogun did that a few times. Yes. Where like you're just unaware of what's what's being said. Yeah, because the the character being played by that uh, the actor Cosmos, uh, the Anjin is in that boat, and it's a really effective way to immediately put yourself in the place that the character yeah. is experiencing. I so Ari Aster works a lot with Martin Scorsese, who is apparently a really big fan of horror movies, yeah. and has been helping Ari Aster get yeah. his stuff, and that's why you see Ari Aster producing other horror movies. I love this trickle down concept of like, hey, we're all auteur directors in our own right. Mm -hmm. Scorsese is never going to direct something that's similar to Ari Aster. Right. But the two of them can get their like 
you know, is anybody going to match my freak? And the two of them are like, yeah. <laughs> was um was it Francis Ford Coppola or was it um, Scorsese that came out with that Twix movie? It came out a few, maybe 10 years ago. I, I don't remember which one it was. It might have been uh, Coppola. It's Coppola. Yeah, because he kind of goes off on his, his weird tangents. But Supernatural filler. Yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't seen that one. Uh, it's got the, what was the lead actress? Ellie Fanning. Yeah. Which I, I, like, yeah. I like Dakota Fanning as well. So, But um, yeah, I saw Scorsese was saying that uh, he was praising Ty West's um, trilogy um, recently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that older directors are willing to lift up new directors and that that continuing of a community that is one of the great things about horror it feels like there is a community yeah that's i mean and that's my big thing with horror is that especially being involved in it in the way that i was like it is a community of people and it's mm -hmm. it's great it feels like the the metal scene you know like i grew up in yeah it, so it's like you, you had you had your your sense of community there and then there's those people that are just like i don't know why you're making the music you're making but okay cool you know whatever but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just do. I do wish that like the, the genre itself would elevate more than, than what we usually get from it. So. Yeah, I think we'll. I think we'll leave it at that. I think we'll stop here because I'm very excited for you to get to watch it, and I feel like there's nothing more I can tell you without spoiling. And I'm genuinely surprised that you are not as not as spoiled as I was expecting you oh, to yeah. be. I was expecting you to be like, I've seen this scene. I've seen that scene. I've seen this on a t-shirt. Yeah. I know this guy who won't stop talking about this. Like you're, you're primed for it, but it is still uh, a bit of a bit of a razor's edge. It could go either way. Yeah. And I, um, I, I can't tell you enough how much I've avoided that movie after Hereditary. <laughs> so that's the reason for it is like, I've seen it mentioned, but I'll just scroll by, you know, because I just don't care. He's my good friend and I like him, but... Danny, do you feel held by him? Does he feel like home to you? Welcome back to episode 18. Oh, God, how did I already forget? It's whatever. Welcome back to the episode. We have now seen Midsommar. You've watched it the first time. I've watched it another time. I was going to watch the director's cut. And I want to tell you something that's really, I find pretentious. The only way to watch the director's cut and extend it 24 minutes is to purchase the physical DVD Blu-ray from A24. Oh, yeah. No kidding. Yeah, so that's the only way. So it's not available online or anything. No, and I was watching clips and... Uh, one of the scenes is shot at night in dark right and that completely changes the movie because the movie that i know has no scenes at night except for the beginning sequences so well the, i'm the, curious the dream scene too yeah yeah of course actually yeah the right, dream yeah. scenes yeah but that's like that's how you know it's a dream for me is because like it's not supposed to be oh and and actually no wait there is that scene where josh goes in to uh take pictures which was at night so just yeah. just curious stuff. I will want to see it, but I'm not sure I want to own it enough to want to see it. You know what I mean? Right, right. I um well cuz when I put it on or I was about to anyway, it's on Max. So mm -hmm. I was like I was like, "Oh, 2 hours and 28 minutes. This must be the director's cut." <laughs> but apparently it's not. No, it isn't. And with Max you get those little commercials, so it's just hmm. just a little bit longer. I was watching it on Max and and I felt pissed because some of the scenes have such an intense like pacing to it and like you're building up to a point and then it'll be like just as you're about and then like a fucking tide commercial cra crap on it i don't have commercials on max because i uh I'm, I'm very rich i don't know if you know i uh i got all kinds of money <laughs> but um I, I have it on um on prime and i find that like they cut for commercial after like one second after the next scene begins and it's mm -hmm. so frustrating for me. Like, like, please time your commercials a little better. But it's not like uh, shows now are shot for commercials. They're just shot, just you know, to, to play are. without them. So, yeah, I guess it's up to whoever works at these companies to insert them into there. Fucking Tubi will literally do it every fifteen or ten minutes. Just it's a timer. So yeah. like a character will be literally mid sentence. A fucking commercial. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I have watched a couple things in Tubi. Um, I just, it. you know, like bad movies that I know are bad, but yeah. still good somehow, you know. I think I mentioned last time I watched uh, Class of Nukem High on, on Tubi. But that's, I think, how I watched uh, old episodes of Airwolf. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, going yeah. back to going back to staying on track with yeah, Midsommar, it was it was two hours and twenty three minutes as its original full length. I'm curious. I should have looked this up before. How long was the runtime on the Vich? Um, I don't remember actually. I'm looking it up right now. Are you okay? An hour and thirty minutes. So a, that's a right. proper. I feel like if you're a horror movie, an hour and thirty is really a good runtime. I'm not going to argue that one at all. That's a good runtime. Well, yeah. I mean, again, I think it's all relative. I mean, you don't notice these like how long movies are if you're having a good time and you're compelled by them. Like Oppenheimer, I didn't notice like the extra long runtime at all. Even in like uh, the Dark Knight movies, they're also pretty long. Um, yeah. Yeah. As long as you're entertained, I don't think it's. I don't think it's horrible. It's just when it takes forever to get somewhere. Yeah, I also have like a you know, for the last couple of years, I've been having a lot of pain issues. Just sitting, sitting. Yeah, uh, I need to like stand up sometimes. So even a movie I really like, sometimes I'm like, we gotta. I need a yeah, intermission. Yeah, yeah I wish if you it, will. I don't remember the last movie I saw with an intermission, but I remember what, there was one. I think as a child, I want to say, and I think it was a uh, Dances with Wolves. Oh, okay, yeah, that's a. Yeah. I could see that one having an intermission or Braveheart. There were a couple from when we were kids that could have used and might have used an intermission. Yeah, which oh, I mean is, is I think is unheard of in in theaters now. I will put that at the back end. I'll Google this yeah. fact for people. We will know eventually what the last film to have an intermission in American theaters was, but it's just not going to be right now. So, <laughs> did you think this was? Did you think this was too long? Um. Yeah, I think it did. I, I think it yeah. was a little bit long. Um, there's certainly some areas it could have been trimmed, but I do appreciate that it was mostly just to build a story and build suspense. So I can't say that I it, it wasn't well used time. It's just that I feel like it could have been trimmed an extra 20 minutes just from scenes that went on forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I, I know that the the runtime was uh, it, it felt like it could have been trimmed a little bit, but I know that um, it was in an effort to build suspense, to build that uneasiness, um, and I mean, it's 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 nicely shot, so it's like you can't really complain about it because it doesn't feel it doesn't feel out of place. I guess. That's, what I mean to say is that it doesn't feel out of place, like the extended scenes and just those those extra moments that we spend with people's reactions and that sort of thing. So, I was so curious about this because two hours and twenty minutes for me is usually too long, right. especially for a horror movie. I'm I'm probably going to be the first person to say like I doubt you're able to make that work, and I do agree. There is like a certain amount of like. Uh, you know, build up that needs to happen for any kind of religious horror folktale period piece, which is why I immediately thought, like, how long is the bitch? How long do they take to build up to what they're building up to? Uh, and I, I took pacing notes. Yep. And anytime something really notable or something scary or big happened, I, you know, I took down the note of the time just to see how we were doing. And like our first pretty horrific thing happens at 11 minutes in when her family is killed. Yeah. Like, so it doesn't take very long to get scary, to get, you know, have higher stakes. And the longest space between anything not happening is 20 minutes, which does feel a little long for me. The space between when Sweden starts and the, the Atsupa, yeah. It's just a little bit long and like it, you, nothing is really happening. You're just kind of seeing the Hargas and you're like, huh, ah, this feels weird. I'm not sure about this. Yeah. And then it starts to confirm that it's weird. So I'm not sure that needed to be 20 minutes. Yeah. I mean, cause they had, uh, they didn't want her to come and then she came and then they go on a mushroom trip mm -hmm. and, and then they get into the town 
and then you have mm-hmm. build up a little bit there and then I, mm-hmm. I feel like they I don't remember if the scene where um the actor starts paying attention to Christian happens before that or was it after I'm not I don't remember but uh Ma- Maja the sister yeah yeah the yeah. the redheaded girl with no eyebrows mm-hmm. I forget her name mm-hmm. but um yeah Maja is Isabel Grill uh the actress yeah um yeah. very striking yeah for sure she's definitely got a striking look to her and um and then like obviously the cliff scene which was like one of the scenes that like I knew where it was going mm-hmm. and you know like once they sat down at the dinner table and then like once they started get walking away i was like oh no so these guys are these guys have hit 72 and they're gonna go sacrifice themselves in some way but so it's kind of like the build up there was was great but you kind of knew what was going to happen so it almost got a little frustrating because you're just like all right well just you guys just jump yet yeah because they do say they talk about their um they have the spring, the summer, and so on, and the winter, and they say, like, oh, yeah, from 56 to 72, that's your winter. And you're like, 72 then, you say. So what happens What happens that's after 72 then? That's yeah. such a specific number to know. Like, why right. would that? So you do know the Etsup is coming. I think it's curious because we see Christian Google the word, mm-hmm. but we don't see him display the result of Googling the word. He didn't, he didn't have service, but then, mm-hmm. um, the other guy and I'm trying to blank on his name, um, Josh, the black guy or Mark, the, uh, idiot joker. Yeah. The, the Josh, um, mm-hmm. seems to know what, what it is, but doesn't say anything. He just smiles. Doesn't seem to say him. anything. Yeah, yeah. Which is curious. So if you were hanging out with someone whose parents were just murdered by their bipolar daughter and and right. like you're you're there with this and they all died and you're there with the sister do you think you might say to her like i don't think you should come to this event i'm not really going to explain to you what it is because it's really traumatic but like i know that people are going to die and maybe you shouldn't come i know i'm not your boyfriend i know i don't have any real big skin in this but just as another human fucking being yep. maybe i should care about you <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like it, it would it would make sense to mention it. And if I was with somebody or, you know, like in a group or with that person in a relationship, the second that happened, I'd be like, OK, let's go. He d- he doesn't stand in front of her or block no. her view. He covers his own eyes. Right. But he doesn't take any responsibility for her at all. He even starts yeah. gagging and almost throwing up and she just continues. Yeah. 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 Which I mean, I guess, uh, yeah, we're supposed to not like that character. So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I get that, but at the same point, yeah, it just seems like somebody would. I mean, the other couple that came, um, separate from them, like, would seem to be Simon only and that Connie. Yeah, they seem to only react to it. So, yeah, I kind of took that as Simon and Connie represent a an actual healthy, loving relationship. Right. And so like they're going to object to what's happening first. And so they are not going to assimilate into the Hargas, which are a cult. And like I, I'm gonna I wanna go down this for a hot second, but I do want to take a tangent because we talked about Josh for just a second here, and I wanted to just comment on the fact that that is William Jackson Harper who played Cheaty on The Good Place. Have you ever seen that show? Oh yeah, yeah, I've seen it. I love that show, and I didn't see that before I saw Midsommar Guy. So I didn't know he was in this movie at all, so I got to watch it again being like, oh, fuck, I actually know you. Yeah, it's funny you say that now. I didn't know that. I didn't realize that anyway. Because yeah. he's such a button-down, like, uh, the button-down nerd in, um, or button-up nerd, sorry, in uh, a good place that I didn't even, didn't even register. And that's partially why I'm thinking, like, Cheaty, you're so emotionally deep yeah. and connected. Why would you let this happen to Danny? But I mean, so I will say that um, Will Pol- uh, Poulter is mm-hmm. just like such a great actor. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I like I disliked him like the whole time, and it was like, but I like him as an actor. You know, and I like all the films he's been in, and I love um, what was that movie he was in with uh, Ed Helms and uh, Jennifer Aniston. Um, where they're in a camper 
and they like rob a bank or something like that. Meet the something or I don't know, something oh, like that. We're not there yet. Or uh, okay. my God, what the, what is the name? I hate being old. If we were doing this podcast, I'm like, we're the Millers. It's called. I oh, why does this keep happening? <laughs> If we were doing this like in our twenties. We'd be like, "Yeah, it's, it's this movie with this person." But no, I mean, like he was he was great, and I I think he's like a good representation of of a lot of people that I've met. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, he's had a bit of a glow up recently as well. So he's yeah, getting yeah. even more and more more work. He was kind of stuck in that like playing the little shit for a while because he had back yeah. back fighting but yeah. it it works for this character and and, and then some. I actually didn't like Christian. I didn't like him, and I think he was that great of an actor. Mm -hmm. But then I was reading um, behind the scenes that he decided that last scene where he's he's naked, mm -hmm. that he was supposed to actually have something covering himself. But he says that they do that to women so much in film where they just kind of exploit their bodies like in, in these moments. He's like, I just want to do the whole thing naked to kind of level the playing field. Wow. I, I gained a lot of respect for him for, for that. Cause like he had just watched um last house on the left or something like that. And wow. like, it was like, no, I, I just want to be completely vulnerable in the scene. And, and like, that's why the end of it is, is him naked running through the, uh, that's great. Commune. That is really great. I did not know that. I, I really, uh, that yeah, much respect on that. I, I will admit his performance gets better the more I watch it. Uh, because I have time to pay attention to what he's doing and to not just hate him because the character right. is written so. So this, this is an interesting tangent as well. I think that a lot of people I know who didn't like this film didn't like this film because they empathized with Christian a lot uh, mm -hmm. because they had at one point in time done something similar in a relationship or felt like he was justified in some of the stuff that he did, but I also find him to be written in such a clearly unlikable way that I find that empathizing a bit strange. What do you think? No, I mean, I, for sure. And I think, I think we've been in, we've all been in relationships where somebody is like, you kind of include them because you feel like you have to, you know, because like you have a hard time setting boundaries yourself, you know, and mm -hmm. And so you kind of, so you can, you can empathize with him, I think for the first half of the movie, I want to say, you know, where it's like, he's trying to be nice to her by, by including her. And then like, but the, the latter half of, of the movie or the, the latter two thirds of it anyway, are, are just kind of like him just being the, the jerk that he is. Mm -hmm. So like, I can understand empathizing with him at the beginning, but not so much towards the end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as we start to learn more and more things about him, he does a lot of like interesting self justification. Like, he doesn't ever really totally lie, but he also never really gives the whole truth to anyone. So he can right. walk around that. Like, the, the interaction with Josh when he wants to do his thesis on the Hargas and yeah. how, like, he doesn't seem even slightly like this is a questionable or weird thing to have done. Right. But well, then, like in his actions and in his words afterward, he's like, "But we can share it." And then, like, he just harbors these kind of resentments towards people. And I think, I think that is that is kind of relatable too. Is that you, you sometimes harbor resentments that you don't speak out loud. So you punish people in your life for for that mm -hmm. without ever actually being open to them about like why you feel this way or, or you know, like your feelings in general. So I think that's, I mean, it, it's relatable. I don't know that it would be something to aspire to, but. No, no, yeah. but I think that when sometimes people see that as being portrayed as bad, they have a um, defensive reaction. They don't want to watch a movie that makes them feel bad about something they may have done. So then they say that movie was stupid. I don't like that movie. It was bad dumbass movie i wanted to be scared and have fun i didn't want to think about that one time that i didn't break up with that girl because you know her mom just died or like it was right. more convenient for me to wait until after we got back from the trip stupid ass sh shit like that you know that's and that's a whole seinfeld episode too because yeah we <laughs> the stuff that happens in 90s sitcoms is sociopathic through the lens of 20 years later where oh, you're yeah. like you yeah. dumped her because her hands were big yeah 
Oh yeah, no, I mean for sure, for sure. I mean, like, I don't know to even analyze like the amount of relationships and like Friends or Seinfeld that like just went awry because of like one person had a single flaw. <laughs> or they just didn't want to say a thing that was difficult to say or slightly embarrassing, like. Right, but I mean, in 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 terms of the movie, I guess it is kind of more realistic in that way. Is that sometimes there are flaws or or things that like we boundaries that we have as people that these people have crossed, but you just you just kind of like let it pass and then just build resentments towards them about it. So, yeah. Because then you can justify yourself. Like Christian can say, like, I I am saying all the right things. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's doing all the wrong things right. because he's more controlled by the subconscious. Yeah, but you can still paint himself as a victim in this story. I think you could think right. that Christian was a victim here. Um, he is put in the bear at the end, which you know, in Swedish culture, bear represents dishonesty and evil. Mm -hmm. So it's like he was... He was never the the good guy. No, yeah, I mean, you know. he was never going to be. And um, I I still kind of ponder the the smile um, at the end. Yeah, um, yeah. Because like I'm like, well, what does that what does that actually mean? Because I was actually surprised that she chose him over a stranger. And I I guess spoilers here, but yeah, I I was surprised by that because like she seemed like. Um, certainly the ways that I've been in my life before where um, they're at the um, college dorm and they're talking and he's like upset, but she's like still pulling him back to like, please don't go, please don't go, please don't go. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've certainly been there before and I've been in, in times like somebody that was actively abusing me. I was defending them, you know, like, mm -hmm. or keeping up with what they wanted me to to tell people or or say so that I, I protected them as a person. So I was surprised at the end that she she chose him just based on that from earlier scenes, which I guess you know is, is great for a character arc. Mm -hmm. But it's also just surprising. Then when she smiles at the end, I'm still kind of wondering why. Yeah, for for me, I think that what happened there. Oh God. It's a, just an incredibly codependent relationship. Like it's toxic. She, we we know that, but obviously there's something that Danny is getting from being with Christian. Otherwise, she would she would leave. She feels kind of like addicted to it, almost as if it is a drug. Um, and 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 I say like don't empathize with Christian, and or you'll you'll miss the point of the movie. I think empathizing with Danny too much will also make you miss the point of the movie, in in my opinion, because both of them are deeply flawed. She is continuing this relationship as much as he is continuing this relationship. Right. Just before she makes the decision to choose Christian, she sees him impregnating Maja, and she like totally breaks down and starts to cry in that same sort of like uh, bowing, hurt animal noise. Mm -hmm. And the Swedish women, the rest of the Harga tribe, they make the noise with her. They have that emotion. The first time in the whole damn movie, anybody actually stops to share the burden of the emotional pain that Danny is going through. Right. So she's finally accepted, finally feeling, he said, the line with Pele earlier where he's like, do you feel held by him? Right. feel like in that motion, she feels held by them. So when they ask her, do you want to choose us and stay in this community? Or do you want to break the cycle of your toxic relationship, your codependency and and kill Christian? And, and I think she's smiling because she's finally free. That decision was so needed and so hard right. to make. She needed a whole Swedish cult to do it. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah, I mean, so I, I did love his his speech, and it certainly it, it hit close to home because it's like to to actually be going through something and to be surrounded by people that make you feel validated in your pain and and supported is huge, and it makes a huge difference. You know, mm -hmm. obviously, like I wouldn't suggest joining a cult to feel that way, but I can I can at least relate to the fact that like it is nice to finally feel seen. I guess when when you're struggling with so much and somebody you care about is just ignoring you or, or just brushing you off mm -hmm. but like you said it's 
it's still a cult though. Yeah. So like it does, she smiles. And I think that you could sit there and be like, wow, go, go girl. Way to be a boss bitch. But also like, she basically went from I'm addicted to Christian to now I'm addicted to this cult. It's like, oh, good, you're on methadone instead of heroin, but you're yeah. still like, you're still not okay, man. This is, yeah. this is, uh, a, as much as their version of love was perverse, I think that the Harga version of community is equally perverse. Yeah. And I, I, I did some thinking about that too, because so, like, I, I have this like whole philosophy in my head that, with less choices, like you can be happier. I think that mm. I think that we can be happy, like where we are in the United States, where we have freedoms and and whatnot. Where you know most of us have a, a, a decent amount of freedom uh, as opposed to other places. But then you think about like people in in Africa that deal with like civil wars there constantly, and like food scarcity, and and even in like in, in North Korea, like everything that they deal with. It must be so easy to be happy over such little things there. And I feel like, <laughs> I i mean, like, like even like uh, if you even compare it to like during COVID when we we're all stuck inside, like mm -hmm. how amazing was it when we could finally get out and just do the little things that we used to do. And like, so I look at that, that cult community and it's like, yeah, these things are like are bad and cults are bad. Right. But those people like have, probably like such better happiness there than than we do outside of them and like i think my my huge disagreement with the cult beyond anything else is that they kill people unwillingly you know like some mm -hmm. people were sacrificed that that chose you know that chose this life and chose to be sacrificed but the people that kill mm -hmm. unwillingly that is not so much of a moral gray ground that's you know certainly black and white but mm -hmm. but everything else I mean, it is, it's different than our, our beliefs or our, our way of life, but that doesn't mean that it's bad because of it. Yeah. I definitely think that this film, which as I said, in part one did not play well in Sweden, just didn't, didn't hit. <laughs> oh no, I, I can tell you why too. Yeah. Well, it, it works better as a horror movie for agnostic, nihilistic, non-religious people, because a lot of, and this is what I said I really hated about Vich, which is funny because I like it here and, and, and I'm not sure why, is that it takes traditions and it's like, hey, it, aren't traditions like rituals kind of creepy? Right. No, and absolutely. weird. <laughs> I mean, and it's funny because like, I mean, I do watch a lot of like religious philosophy um, videos and books and it's always funny that like when people criticize something going on, like, wow, you know, how could they sacrifice a goat or something like that? But it's mm -hmm. like, but like every single week you sit in a pew and you drink the blood of a savior and eat his flesh. It's like, and how is that not weird to you? You know, it's not weird because yeah. it's like how you grew up and it's just an accepted reality. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, like, like most things, yes, it's, it's different. doesn't mean it's bad, but obviously killing people against a will is bad. So that's that like spectrum -y thing where we're like, okay, so we can take the weirdness and inherent like eeriness to things we don't know and we can exploit that and be like, here are the Hargas. They have traditions. Yeah. And then Aster kind of pushes that and pushes that and pushes that to the point where he's like, at what point do you, the audience, feel like what is done on the grounds of tradition or culture or religion too much because right. there's a lot of stuff we'll feel like well you know if it's their culture they should do it you know like they are um they're uh they're luring people in and killing them yeah <laughs> well i mean I, and, and like i feel the same way about american culture that people are like you're like oh this is okay because it's part of the religion i'm like no it's not okay it's not it's just not uh, it's not, not okay. really okay um, the film did do the one thing that like, I like hate and love at the same time. Ooh. Was, uh, one of the opening shots where they display that, um, that tapestry and like the camera pans by it, it shows the exact situation that Christian ends up in with Maja. Right. Yeah. Which is like, I don't like, I enjoy that. I enjoy, but I enjoy it in the way that, um, James Franco did with the interview. Hmm. 
where like at the beginning, like he just makes a bunch of jokes about all these things that are going to happen. And then like they happen. He did the same thing in uh, Pineapple Express. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or um, this is the end. So, like they make jokes of like all these things that are going to happen. And you're just like, oh, that's so silly. But then they actually happen. And, and then like it's it's cool and it's funny. But and this it's like as soon as they pan past started pan past that blanket, I'm like, all right, so I'll look for all of these things in the movie. So like. And, and it doesn't like negate the the impact of it necessarily, but so like when Christian finds a pubic hair in his in his in his food, I'm like, okay, so next up he's gonna drink something with period blood in it, and it's like, it was like the shot of like all their cups, and like mm-hmm. that was this colored was a great it was a great shot. I enjoyed it, but it's also like I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's like lazy directing or lazy exposition. But at the same point, it, it does kind of feel that way. Like mm-hmm. it would have been, it would have been cooler to kind of unravel that mystery, or like, or go back and realize that those things happened, and then like, and then knowing what you know at the end of the movie. But by pan and by the tapestry, you're just like, all right, well, this is gonna happen. So mm-hmm. I guess I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known that the, his pink lemonade at the end was tainted with anything without the tapestry ahead of time, which meant that you would either have to do verbal exposition prior or verbal exposition afterwards. And in the pacing chart, once you get to that point, something is happening every seven or eight minutes with a death literally two minutes after. So like once it gets to the back end of an hour and 45, it just collapses in on itself and it's just fucking going through everything that it's set up yeah. so i'm not sure the pacing structure would have allowed for them to explain it after it happened yeah i mean and i think i think there was like some small amount of exposition there about it um so the woman that. says he says i think i ate one of her pubes and she goes sounds right yeah 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 just just that level of, of matter of fact like yeah probably yep <laughs> But I mean, yeah, so I mean, it was it, like I said, it, it isn't necessarily lazy exposition or lazy directing. It's just like it, it does just kind of dissolve some of the mystique around it, though, like because I would have liked to have like gone back and been like, oh, weird, like everybody's drink looks the same except for his. Mm-hmm. Or I could have probably noticed it right away, but knowing, knowing that from ahead of time, I, I mm-hmm. you know. Because they also need to explain that, like, his actions after that are uh, he's kind of owned. He's kind of not responsible. He's uh, yeah. in a trance. Yeah. So to be like, why is Christian suddenly OK with fucking Maja? Why is he shaking around so much? What is it? Is it just drugs? And you're like, well, it's a little bit of drugs. It's a little bit of he's magic. under the spell of a woman's period yeah. blood. I don't know. And like, so that brings me to the whole concept of the folklore in this like obviously the hargas are not a real community Uh, Mm -hmm. obviously this is only very loosely based on swedish tradition and they mix in norse tradition right how do you feel about all of that like i have a theory as to why they did that i don't want to start first i want to let you talk about how you feel about that i think any culture has any kind of um sort of rituals or things that we do or things that are just part of part of our cultural narrative that can be twisted to, to mean something else. I mean, if you look at the creation of vampires, um, I mean, they had a lot to do with, um, I can't think of the name of the disease. Was it tuberculosis? Uh, there's also a disease where you can't go out, out in the sun cause you're photosensitive, put it at the liner notes. <laughs> <laughs> but they, um, but they just, they have that, that, that basis off of, things that actually happen or superstitions that we develop that that can kind of be exploited into horror as far as those traditions that they they kind of hijacked and 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 pushed in a certain direction i mean it could have been any culture it could have been in, it could have been happened in austria it could have happened anywhere else so um i wasn't like I wasn't really fixated on like, oh, well, what's the actual cultural belief behind this? Or like, where does this actually come from or anything like that? I just kind of accepted the narrative that I was given about the about the culture and the, the folklore, as opposed to just kind of like trying to pick it apart or anything like that. So mm-hmm. it is 
so fucking dense. They did actually work on developing a full culture here. And a lot of the stuff that is jumped off on has a, has a point in either mythology or reality or perceived what could have happened. And the, the runic alphabet, that's, that's all really real. So like every single character is wearing a dress with a little mm-hmm. rune carved into the middle. And, and those all correspond to what is happening in the scene and their character's development. And like, you don't need to know that. You don't. And most people aren't going to know that. And yet that is still there. And mm-hmm. like, I kind of, I as a that kind of nerdiness i want to be like damn that's the sign of good is that you put it in and you're like i don't give a fuck if people figure it out i know i need it to be there right. um, but also that is kind of the the like base level for pretension too so <laughs> you know would you in your film bother to be that level of detail knowing that like it doesn't really affect most modern audiences are not going to pick up on like, oh, um, Danny's dress at the end contains the symbol for uh, radio, which is journey. And then also um, the symbol that could both mean new beginning and like death and rebirth. Like, oh, that's really cool. I get why she's wearing that right now. But also you can just watch the movie. Right. I mean, it's I enjoy when they have painstaking details that like you don't even really notice like um, Game of Thrones is a good example of that, like mm-hmm. uh, the things that they wove into the dresses that that told the story that you would not you're like you're not even going to notice it. You're just going to see a green dress, you know, so mm-hmm. I appreciate that. I mean, the nerd in me is like part of the reason I, I always liked Zack Snyder so much was that like in his comic book films, there'd be so many things that he would just stick into a scene that like you just would not realize right away that when you go through it after the fact, you're like, oh, that like directly corresponds to this comic book or this thing. So I I do enjoy it when they do stuff like that. Yes, actually, there's something like that in this movie that I didn't notice until this go around. And I'm not, I'm not sure if you noticed either. Uh, Just we'll get there in a little roundabout way. My first question is, have you seen? The Wicker Man. Yes, yes. Um, the, the one with Nicolas Cage. You know, I've seen them both, but also the one with Nicolas yeah. Cage. So yeah. we'll work off the Nicolas Cage one. I think it's uh, the two women at the beginning of Wicker Man. They meet mm-hmm. Nicolas Cage in the bar, and then they bring him back to the community. You yeah. remember that aspect of Wicker Man? Yes, I, it's, it's been quite a few years, but, but yes, yeah. But yeah, yeah. And then at the end, they reveal that, like, Oh, it was all preordained. This is always supposed to happen. He was always the one who is going to be picked. And that's like a kind of weird little reveal at the end of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. In this one, there's a Mayflower crown in Danny's room, her bedroom where her family dies. Yeah. It's uh, yeah around her photo. Do you think that that means the Hargas were responsible for all of this from the beginning? No, I, I think it's just the. Uh, <laughs> I think it's just visual, visual cues. Just visual, okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, Aster puts so much like to do so much detail into the costuming iconography. I kind of feel like Ari, why would you put that there? Well, it has to be there for some reason. Right. It's the only colorful item, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did notice that. Um, I don't know if you noticed that her sister's face in a tree with the the tube in it. Mm-hmm. Because I, I actually, I didn't notice it, and then like, so I, I learned about it after the fact and rewound to the the scene, and I was like, oh, okay, didn't notice that right away. There's a lot of imagery of people going back to nature as they mm-hmm. get closer and closer. Like the Hargas are this agricultural society. I feel like the closer Danny gets to converting to the cult, the more people start to become part tree, part tree. She yep. has the grass coming through her hands and feet. The people at the end that they pre-kill have all the trees coming out of their yep. mouths and arms, yep. which reminded me of the uh, Titus Andronicus uh with Alan Cumming, where yeah. Lavinia has the sticks it's out of her serious, arms. Yeah. That's that's one of my favorite movies ever made. So, also my favorite Shakespeare story. So, ditto. Oh, I'm right there with you. I saw some. I, I have a friend who told me about a version of it that was done in Los Angeles called Titus Clownicus, and it was an all clown version of it. And so, the reason why Lavinia can't talk is because she's got too much peanut butter in her mouth, and her fingers are held together with Chinese finger traps. 
You know what? I almost prefer that version better. <laughs> Just a little ki- a kid's version of it for yeah. you. Yeah, I always thought that uh, Titus Andronicus um, was what informed the creation of the Stark family in, uh, in Game of Thrones. Oh, wow. Because you have this, this celebrated war hero. Yeah, that ultimately just has all this bad shit happen to him and his family. Oh, wow. So I always kind of, I guess I, I liked Game of Thrones more because I always compared Ned Stark to to Titus Andronicus. So. That is a great way to look. I want to rewatch the show thinking about that. That's never occurred to me, and I do like that perspective. But anyway, I can I can go off on Shakespeare shows. and. Mm-hmm. But I, so I I anticipated not liking this movie and I actually did like it. I still think it like it was like a little long, but mm-hmm. not in like a terrible way. Actually, I was gonna watch half of it and then like watch the the rest of it after the fact, but I ended up watching yeah. it just in one sitting. Um, oh, wow! Through. So it was like it was enjoyable for a lot of a lot of reasons. Certainly not. I don't think it it lives up to the hype that everybody is mm-hmm. kind of made around it. You know, like I don't think it was that profound of a horror movie it essentially mm-hmm. boils down to it is a cross between hostel and get out but in sweden how so because like, even even some of the same beats are the same um like uh in hostel when they're at the hotel and they notice that their friend has left uh their icelandic friend mm-hmm. they're like oh he left and they was like oh but he wouldn't have left without a note or out without doing this they mm-hmm. do the same thing in this film with that um that couple that comes in after the fact like Oh, your your boyfriend left already. Oh, he wouldn't have done that without leaving a note. Oh, okay, but yeah, he's gone. And then, so it just reminded me of those same beats from Hostel. And it's like you have these uninformed American kids that are experiencing another culture, like in in Europe, where they are they are prized possessions because they're they're gonna be murdered. Mm. Obviously, not for money this time, but it's just. So it's like it's it's just a lot of similarities there, and then like the whole get out thing, it, it kind of makes me like you're in a situation where you know that it's not idea, and you know that these people are using you in some way, shape, or form, mm-hmm. and you know that there's like something sinister hidden behind the scenes, mm-hmm. and you have to you have to leave that situation, but ultimately you end up staying, and and antics ensue. So mm-hmm. it felt like a combination of those two movies, just in. Okay, yeah, I mean, I can see the beat points. I, I disagree with the overall message because, you, you know, in Get Out, you leave. and Get Out, they're terrible right. racists trying to steal your body, oh, yeah. and there's yeah. no uh, main character going back. For me, I just feel like I think this movie – yeah, it's disappointing for people because it's not really a horror movie. It's a it's a very horrific hero's journey right. where we see Danny like get out of a bad relationship and sure into a cult, but out of a bad relationship. So I, I feel like in 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 Get Out he does get out of a bad relationship. So I will I will give you that. So yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but those the tropey beats of like okay, so why didn't this person, they just left without a note? Like, that's a thing that they use in horror movies across the board. I think I can think of more than just those that one, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And so, I mean, like, yeah, the resolve isn't the same, but, you know, like, mm-hmm. it it just felt, uh, the beats felt very similar. And I, mm-hmm. I noticed it as I was watching it, which is fine. I mean, because I enjoy yeah. both Hostel and Get Out. I think they're some of the better horror movies that have been made in the past 20 years. So, um and horror has tropes like horror movies remind oh, yeah, know, about the horror movies like it has it kind of goes that way right i do like when they eschew the tropes though or like or they flip them around in, in some kind of way you know like that's enjoyable to me that kind of goes back to your like overarching feeling of you gotta know when shit sucks to know when it doesn't yeah. so like if you live in this constant low grade like eh, this isn't so great then when things are kind of good it's really great so if like everybody makes tropey shitty horror movies the one or two horror movies that aren't tropey people are like fuck yeah yeah, yeah those are the best ones so yeah, yeah. i mean it's it's uh, like tropes are, are tropes for a reason it's nice to see them in a lot of horror movies because it just mm-hmm. you connect to the, the classics in that way Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're done well. Right. But then, you know, like uh, to 
at least try to subvert them sometimes. I actually, I just watched uh, In a Violent Nature the other day for the first time. I haven't seen that yet. What are your thoughts? So it's enjoyable because it feels like a slasher movie. Uh huh. And, and a lot of the same ways that slasher movies have existed for, you know, the past, what, 40, 50, 50 years? She's 50 years. Wow, I'm getting old. Yarg. But, um, but it was nice to have, like, you know, the film not have, like, a lot of just terrible conversations. Like, it followed the, the killer himself around, which which is nice. So, it, like, it, yeah. it eschewed the, the normal format of slasher movies in favor of what is essentially just basically a, a basic slasher movie, like not a huge, not a huge backstory there. Like it's all put up like pretty like right up front. Um, mm -hmm. the, the teens in it are just as annoying as they always are in, in slasher movies. Yeah. But it turns some of the, some of those things on, on their head, which made it more enjoyable. That, that is an interesting thing that horror movies kind of have to do. They have to have characters that are not enjoyable. Because there, there's a certain point of like rooting for the deaths of certain people. Right. And that's a really fine line to walk because sometimes it's hard to, to watch a movie where you don't care about anyone and right. they're dying and you kind of have to care about them. So that is a you know hard thing to do. Rob Zombie definitely achieved that with his Halloween uh, remakes where like you just did not care about any character enough to want them to live. So like when they died, you're just like, oh, well. And I feel the same way about uh, the one with the Art the Clown, the All Hallows Eve, or Terrifier. Ter terrifier. Like I didn't care about anybody in the film, like enough to actually be invested. I actually, I I saw the first one and I watched maybe ten minutes of the second one, and I was like, all right, I'm just like, who cares, you know? So, mm -hmm. but it was nice. Like in this movie, like they spent a lot of time in Midsummer to build in character, and even if you didn't like them, they still they still built that up. Like Will Polder's character is so unlikable, but it's also enjoyable to watch him like just fumble through all these these different situations where he is the asshole. Like no matter what. There's the scene where he, you you may first find out that he is no longer with us unless you're like not totally paying attention and you don't get what's going on. Uh, where you see the I believe the word is pronounced Nabrock, the. Mm -hmm. uh, the little pants that that person is wearing made of skin and the scrotum from the waist down. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is one of the few things that is real. And there's a real version of it in a museum somewhere. You can Google it online and see a picture of it. Um, it was like warlock pants and you would get mystical powers from wearing them. When he looks down at Josh, when the person wearing Mark yeah. looks down at Josh. That's kind of like our first real confirmation of shit going down. There's a close up on the eyes. Now, I haven't Googled this, but I, because I, I just watched it last night. There's such an intense close up on the eyes. They look to me, they're female in deep blue, but there's so many female deep blue because we're in yeah. Sweden. What, like, what are your thoughts on that? No, I, I mean, I, I certainly think it's just the actor that's, that, uh, got upset with him oh no wait, that's um that's the guy who oh you think the guy who is is inside mark okay yeah that makes sense yeah i think it's just him because like i i vaguely remember him having blue eyes too but... mm -hmm. i mean it's sweet and never got blue eyes yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah yes. and then the um the torture that they do to simon is also presumably real it's called the blood eagle torture where they oh, yes. break your back open and they cut your ribs off from your spine and then they pull your lungs out through that way thoughts on that so that seemed like i was i was watching it and like those lungs are definitely moving yeah they're supposed to still be breathing so this, i don't like no one I, I guess knowing what i know about about the blood eagle like that i mean death is almost instantaneous um yeah. in those situations yeah. but i think I like the ambiguity of maybe he was still alive, but I also think it was because Christian was tripping still at that point that he was, yeah. that he saw the lungs like moving. So I really like, I mean, I enjoyed that scene for sure. I was surprised by it, I guess, because there's no way that that wouldn't cause a lot of screaming. Maybe if you were unconscious. I, I don't know. I mean, it just, yeah, maybe, but yeah. still it's just, that's a, it's an intense amount of pain to put through some someone through and to have no one notice that at all no. even the sound of it, you know like i in, yeah. in a small commune like that like 
snapping someone's ribs all the way down. I mean, like, uh, everybody's chipping balls 90% of the time, too. So, like, (laughs) unreliable narrators here. Yeah, they're definitely going to hear that sound, though, for sure. And it's in with the chickens. Chickens are very loud. I will say, I can attest, my chickens are fucking loud. It's fair. But, I mean, also, when you're chipping balls, you hear and see things very well. You hear and see things so very well, you hear and see things that are not there. Yes. (laughs) That's what I hear anyway. That's what people tell me. I've, I've never... Been, we wouldn't know. I've never participated in such things, and I never would. But the Blood Eagle is something that, while there are accounts of it, and there are writ- writes, like, uh, written things about it, there are no corpses ever found. There's no actual archaeological right. evidence to say that that ever happened. And the same thing is true with the Itsupa, the, the concept of like there being a group that that would have done that in that way uh, i think that the most reason because i was talking to a friend of mine who is uh, really into norse mythology and kind of majored in it the reason why those kinds of stories would become prevalent was more likely from somebody outside trying to make people scared and say like oh did you know that the vikings did this oh did you know that there's a group of people who sacrifice their elders because it really doesn't make any sense that the the litmus for being a successful community at that point in time would have been to have people live very, very long. Much of Swedish tradition upholds the like importance of elders. So that it really makes no sense to have done this as part of a Swedish tradition. But then I think that that, for me, really adds up to the perversion. Like That's why the Hargers are a cult. If they weren't, they'd just be Sweden, and this would just be a normal story where about a girl went to Sweden, found community, and then like she could yeah. just go on. Like, no, she's still fucked at the end. Like that smile is really like the reason you thought about that so much. I also think about that. Like she's smiling, but it's not a happy ending. But it's kind of like a happy ending in Brazil, where like she feels happy. So is that happy enough for us? I mean, it's. And that's like, yeah, part of it was that like at the end, like I'm like, all right, so why the smile? And like I, I had to sit and think about it, which is nice. I like films that make you sit and think about things exactly why mm-hmm. that would happen. But I feel like it's some kind of uh, some false ground that she's hitting, you know, like where mm-hmm. she feels free. But, you know, like a like a slave is released from chains only to find a stronger set of bondage kind of situation. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You shouldn't feel good if you just watched it, if you're literally watching people burn to death in front yeah. of you. Like, oh. Yeah. Ah, oh, fuck that guy. I do enjoy that they kind of like hint at the commune just being essentially built on a lie. And uh, when they give the two volunteers a, a sap of the yew tree. Mm. And like to feel no fear and to, I forget what the other one was, but. Feel no pain. Uh, feel no pain. So the guy, the guy when he starts catching on fire, looks to his, his friend in fear. And then the other guy starts screaming out in pain. Yeah, it didn't work at all. That's a really, really good point. Really good point. I like that. I I enjoy that they kind of dissect it in such a way that like, this is not, this is the same thing as everything else that happens in the world. You know, this is, mm-hmm. it, it feels different, but it's, it's just exactly that it's, it's everything. It's everything that happens in a world in a different, in a different outfit, you know? Yeah, it's still a falsity. It's still a lie. You're still being taken advantage of. You gave yourself willingly and you're, you're, this is what you got. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I think that might be also the reason why people like this movie so much is because there's so much complexity. You can delve into each individual scene and really like nerd the hell out like oh the cinematography here uh the first time we hear christian he is a disembodied voice on the phone they never cut to him once it's like she's having a conversation with herself and then you see her in mirror like you can go cinematography nerd on this but also like you know some people just wanted to watch a movie so there are the people who are like this is god and then there are the people who are like this was a two and a half hour movie (laughs) I mean, some of it too, like, um, it's a little on the head, like, Mm -hmm. like the guy's name is Christian and he's killed at a a pagan festival for being dishonest. In all of your literature and movie experience, what do you think is the worst character name you've ever encountered for that, 
For me, it's Pita in the Hunger Games, the, the son of a bread maker whose name yeah. is Pita. Yep. Yep. I uh I couldn't say. I'd have to I'd have to like really sit think, down and think, think about on it. it. It's like yeah, I mean like sometimes they do kind of give you those those cues right away just by this the name of somebody, you know. But yeah, I'd really yeah. have to think about that one for sure. But yeah. Here comes Big Dick Bronson. Oh, yeah. didn't go by what, Richard. I wonder what his accolades are. <laughs> I wonder, yeah, is that going to be our tank or our rogue? So as we approach the end, my my common questions. Did you have a favorite scene and a least favorite scene? I think my favorite scene was the uh, the cliff scene. The old, yeah. old people sacrifice themselves. I really do like a good smash face special effects. Mm -hmm. so one thing I appreciate about a hereditary like uh, the girl hits the telephone pole i'm sorry I, I i can't i can't help but laugh at that scene it's just like it plays like a slapstick comedy but it's so horrific but well i mean the weeds were laughing their ass off at this exact scene so they're there with you yeah so i like i enjoy it um and i i do like the the comedy that that happens when the old man sacrifices himself where he doesn't quite make it and they have to they have to beat his head in and it's it's funny because like they have this big ceremony going on and all this and somehow he he just bungles it you know like he just completely fails at what he's supposed to do feet first you idiot go head first yeah like and it's just so that there i guess there's like levity in it but at the same time it is a brutal scene and i, I just really enjoyed it. it stuck out to me for sure i think that that is where ari aster is his best he likes to kind of be a little bit between isn't this so horrific? It's kind of funny. And what a weird thing to get known for. I'm very good at doing crushed heads. Yeah. Like, mm, get it in there. No, the I mean, first time I saw this movie, that scene stuck with me the most because they didn't pull away. Most movies would have cut away so that you didn't right. see the FX on the head. And they were like, no, we worked it. Yeah. Keep looking. No, and it was a, it was great. It was, it was well done. I... I've seen a lot of um, videos in, in my life, unfortunately, like where people are actually injured or, or have died. Um, I mm. thought of one that um, a kid jumps off the side of um, like a wall to go into the river and ends up smashing his face open on concrete. Ooh. And the video shows his face afterward and two hands like holding it from being split in half. So like, it just immediately the second I saw that in, in the film, like it just immediately brought me back to having seen that, and it, it like felt it felt more realistic than the rest of the gore in the movie. So, yeah, yeah, it's like a classic like fan of gore. It, it was very enjoyable. Yeah, and it's kind of funny how there is stuff that's mystically happening in this movie, but the stuff that is the most visceral and most horrific or haunting to me is the realism. Like this isn't Jason. This isn't a Pennywise like this is people being really into a religion and we definitely exist in a world where I have seen people be so into a religion that they've killed other people so it's scarier because like you said it feels real you've seen a face like that that is a real thing that you have experienced so that's going to hit you way more than like hey here's this guy wearing his legs his uh, pants yeah <laughs> It's just still upsetting. Yeah, sure. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, Do not upsetting. get me wrong. Very upsetting. But also, I I also watched that and was like, oh, he's got his wizard pants on. So, like, you know, I'm I'm a little skewed yeah. on that. So that's fair. That's fair. I'm also a big fan of Ed Gain. So I just, you know, yes, I'm used to, I'm used to people wearing other people's skin. I guess. Yeah, it's just leather. You know, it makes total sense. But that that scene, I think also a lot of special effects artists uh, will have said that they they use real, real clips of actual medical right. accidents right. to to figure out how to do their special effects. I'm spacing on the guy's name, and I guess I'll put it in the liner notes. He uh, got drafted and into Vietnam, and he How's that's how mean? he. Savini, that's how yeah, he made yeah. it through Vietnam by looking at all of the the violence and being like, "This is, this is good notes for later." No, yeah, for sure. And like, I should qualify what I said earlier about me having seen a lot of these videos was that it was a part of like doing the zombie calendar that yeah 
I would sit with and watch these videos all the time. I mean, not that I didn't hop on the like rotten.com as a teenager or anything like that, but mm-hmm. it's like, I would sit and watch these videos and watch like how these wounds happen and, and all that. And like those would inform, like we'd do it with the, with the other makeup artists and, and that would kind of inform some of the makeups that we did. So it is mm-hmm. certainly good to draw from real life, but also I, I could have gone without seeing a lot of the things I've seen in my life. And I wish mm-hmm. that, Eternal Sunshine was real, so I could just wipe out some of those memories. Or at least the Men in Black pen. Yeah, at least. I think people don't realize that. When when the people who bring you these kinds of special effects are going to schools where this is part of the curriculum. I mean, as much as if you went to be a mortician, right. autopsy, this would all be part of the curriculum. You need to have some sort of basic understanding of the uh, anatomy and what happens when X happens. Forensic pathologists are also doing this so yeah. that you know that makes sense to me yeah i mean like the internet uh i, I wish it didn't exist sometimes because i wish i hadn't seen a lot of things i did but still in the same way i was i was always happy to, to go through a little misery to bring people joy with makeups and ideas and stuff like that so gotta look into the mouth of madness yeah for sure so least favorite scene um i'd say my least favorite scene would be the um the orgy scene Oh, okay. Yeah. But not, I mean, like the ritualistic aspect of it, I think was great. I think, um, I like that they kind of like are still, they put nudity in horror movies still, but like, it's like uncomfortable nudity because like, it's just in a strange situation or it's with bodies that you're not used to seeing nude in film, you know, like the yeah. same way, um, Kubrick did it, um, in the shining, you know, with mm-hmm. the old, mm-hmm. old like, yeah. It's like you're still getting nudity, but it's it makes you feel uncomfortable in some way. So that's it's not salacious. I didn't I didn't um I didn't mind that part, but um just the character of 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 Danny going to see what's happening inside of the hut. Mm-hmm. I feel like it just kind of like I don't know. I guess maybe took away from the journey that she was going through. Like mm-hmm. that you know here she was like um, blessing the harvest and and having won the the dance competition. It's the only movie I'll accept the dance competition in. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Talking to you, James Gunn, but um, I um, <laughs> she, she's going through all these things, like, and she's really at this high, and then and then she's just like, no, I want to go see what's happening in there. And at that point, she rejects Christian, and it, it's just like I, I think I mentioned this maybe in the last time we talked, or maybe just in our private chats that like. In order for you to not like a character, they make them cheat. And it's like not necessary. Like I thought he was a shit person before. Mm-hmm. I I'm still thinking he's a shit person. But like and other people should see that without them cheating. I, I mentioned it in yeah. terms of uh, the wedding singer. Like we already knew that Drew Barrymore's fiance was an asshole. We didn't need him to cheat in order for us to dislike him completely. You know, like I just it felt it felt like kind of like it took away from Danny's personal journey and all the things she she was experiencing to like make her go see him cheating on her. And then, yeah. And then like, like somehow, somehow that gives her the right to like choose death for him. You know, like, like we hate cheating so much that like, we'd want to see this person die. It's just like such a weird American thing, I think. Yeah, it is. It is very, very funny that that is like the quickest shorthand to get your audience to be like, enough is enough. And to a clunkier point in the plot, like they talk about needing new genetics and so they need his sperm, but they could have easily taken it out of him like you take it out of any kind of livestock and use it as they needed to use it. I really, really agree with you on this. I feel like that is lazy and we should come up with something that is better. I do like one small aspect of that scene even though the hargas set up the situation and they pretty much make christian cheat which makes it even stranger that we like lambast him for that decision when he's been shit the whole time is that when she goes to go look at the thing at first they tell her like don't do it don't look you really shouldn't look this isn't for you we're having tons of fun why don't you just stay and have fun with us and forget about what the fuck is going on over there and so like they they make an attempt to for the first time like i said out of all these people stop danny from torturing herself right and she chooses to again anyway so i was like all right i i appreciate that nuance but you're you're ultimately right that is lazy it's yeah. like when they fridge a character and like no, yeah. 
Yeah, like, oh, we this guy wasn't going to fight that guy unless his girlfriend died. Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, like, in a, I, I think I even pointed this out last time that, like, it's the same thing in, like, Dexter. You have a person who's out murdering people and, like, everybody's okay with Dexter until he cheats on Deb. And then, or not Deb. Um, yeah, I forget her name right now. But, like, until he cheats on his wife, like, uh, then you're like, all right, well, I'm going to draw the line here. This like, guy's shit now. It's okay that you tortured all those people, but, but you know. <laughs> That is so weird yeah. that we have that line and that, yeah. I mean, so I guess we could get half as mad at Ari Aster as we do just society on a whole because that's generally how we feel about shit. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, for sure. And it's, it's certainly like a, it's a weird thing that we do. It's a weird thing that we have like this, this beef. And not to say that it's not like a credible thing that to have a problem within a relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, it certainly is, but like. It's so weird that we just kind of view that as the epitome of evil. It's kind of like, I don't know, like Hitler doing everything he did. And then like most people are like, oh, that's fine. But then he's like, well, he cheated on Ava. And they're like, well, well, that's it. We got to stop. I mean, have you seen his landscapes? They're horrible. Like, oh, well, <laughs> then that's that's my point. Yeah, That's it. <laughs> that's it. It's like, I don't know. I just want to I want to hate a character that can also be monogamous, you know, like. Mm -hmm. And I want to see a character end a bad relationship before that point. Right. You know, or without that point. It doesn't have to be that way. Like you, the wedding singer is a wonderful example of like, right. that didn't, she should have left before that. That didn't have to happen. Um, women should right. be capable of being stronger than like, oh, so now that I have been fully spurned, like, no, he's a dick. You leave him. Don't have him reject you so hard that you can then reject him without feeling bad or having the audience view you as, like, uncouth or whatever the fuck it is. Yeah, I, I think that's like a, I don't know, it's like a thing that I would say that men are probably more guilty of in in this context, like, uh, when it comes to writing, at least, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's like the savior complex kind of thing where you, like, you write these, like, terrible characters that are getting all the women and then they cheat on them, you know, like... I don't know, or like the same thing. Um, uh, I don't know if you watched the last episode of House of the Dragon. I like, did. Um, but, um, you have two females that are talking. One's talking about like this sexual trauma she experienced at the hands of like her father, and they immediately start getting romantic afterward. It's, it's like cute. nobody, nobody does that. Nobody <laughs> talks about their trauma, and then immediately is like, "Yeah, I kind of want to get in bed with you now." Thank you. Like, like the second that scene started playing out that way, I literally said out loud to Scott. Oh no, not now. No, not now. That's not a now time no, thing. No, no oh no. no. <laughs> like she literally just told you about being raped by her father and you're like, I wonder if I like women. Yeah. Or you could sniff her hair a little. <laughs> like just but I mean like I feel like that is a, a typical male kind of thing to like that that whole like uh I wanna be a savior kind of thing, you know, like it's just Yeah. Yeah. Now that I've emotionally matched her, we will have sex. That is what women women want. They want like <laughs> emotional, and then then you can totally. It's basically buying us dinner. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just so it's so insane to me. And like I'm like, but yeah, it's just like you like oh well, this character just comforted another character. Obviously, they need to have, be intimate after that. We can split the sex scene like, in here. It's like oh well, this guy is bad, but. He also cheated. So, uh, like, put him in a bear suit and burn him. Let's save this poor woman, yeah. you know? So, it's just, yeah. yeah. I do think it's like lazy writing. So, that was why that scene was my least favorite one of, of the bunch. So, yeah. And I think that, that that might also go back to why they make Danny pick Christian because there's almost a feeling at the end where you're like, oh, is she a powerful woman that has finally gotten out of a toxic relationship? Because she really didn't do any of this like the hargas just made it possible for her to go along with all of this but like yeah. i guess she has to choose him for you to feel like there's some agency but again i feel like you should be ending this movie realizing that like everybody's fucked up and this is not fully a, a happy total result right i appreciate when movies end kind of bleak mm -hmm. and i hope there's never a sequel to it i i really do i'm so tired of sequels to movies I don't want things explained. I don't, I don't care. I don't want to see Dan. What is Danny doing now? Yeah. So did you like this movie more than Hereditary? Yes. Much, much, much more. Um, 
Although I uh, say that Hereditary did a better job of in- instilling like suspense and mystery, mm. but I don't know if that's necessarily because it's the entire movie is shot at night oh. as opposed to this one that's like shot during the day. So like, I didn't feel as much like suspense or like things happening behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I do kind of wonder if it, it is like the the difference between night and day, literally. Yeah. Um, well said. But I, well said. <laughs> I felt that way, you know. So, but yes, I, I did like it more more than that. I have no interest in seeing. Um, Bo is afraid. Bo is afraid. I, I, I can't recommend. I cannot, unless you were sitting here saying to me. Oh my God, the cinematography. Oh my God, I'm super really interested in like more of what he's yeah. doing with this creating a really weird, like it is, or if you said to me, you know, Katie, I really loved Kinds of Kindness. Then I would tell you to watch Bo is Afraid yeah. because it is literally the most panic inducing film I've ever seen. It is truly impressive that simply watching a movie could, I almost threw up while watching this movie and like a lot of people say that like oh i watched terrifier and almost threw up and they don't really mean that i mean watching but was afraid my heart rate got raised so much not because of scary stuff but because i was having a panic attack that i had to stop and like go gag a little and i don't recommend that to people i don't think that that's what people want when they're like hey katie should i watch a movie yeah i um i felt that way with open water yes I don't, I, I, yeah, yeah. Mm, that's a really good one. That is a very good bottle episode movie. Would you recommend this movie to other people? I would actually, I would recommend this movie to other people. Mm. I think um, it's enjoyable on its own merits, you know, like even without the director attached to it, even without the uh, amazing actress or, you know, any uh, other actors in it. Um, Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good movie and it's different enough from other horror movies that, it kind of sets itself apart. Yeah, it's funny when it ended, the TV literally said, because it said, did you like it? And I was like, yeah, I liked it. That was good. And the TV goes, oh, good. If you like this, we think you'll like. And then it fucking put up the display for Vivich. Oh, yeah. That's funny. Yeah, because it's, um, it popped up on like IMDb when I was looking actors up and, and trivia and all that. And uh, it says like, uh, you might also like The Witch. And I was like, what? It- as I was scrolling by, it has like the same size icons as like the actors and director and like, or like they'll say other films by this director. Mm-hmm. So like, I was like, wait a second, <laughs> like, what did he have to do with this movie? But mm-hmm. yeah. It's just also folk horror and with a similar slower yeah. pacing and a lead actress that goes on to be quite famous. I do earnestly think I will watch. I will watch it again, especially knowing that it's only an hour and a half. I'll give it a second go. Yeah. Maybe I was just in a shit mood when I saw it. It also has um, the woman that from Game of Thrones that plays Catelyn Stark's sister. She's the mother in that. Oh, shit. Yeah. I don't think I knew that when I saw it. Which is, like, I guess ironic with the uh, the breastfeeding scene and, like, Game of Thrones versus the breastfeeding scene in The Witch. What a, what a niche industry to get yourself involved in. If we need a weird, creepy lady breastfeeding, we are going... Straight to that lady. If we need somebody's head smashed in, get Ari. <laughs> but hey, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta cut your teeth somewhere. Exactly. So to say. So, any final thoughts before we wrap it up? I, I'm, I'm a little more, I guess, a little frustrated with myself that I, I didn't watch it sooner. That I kind of just let my dislike for Hereditary kind of seep into tuning out anything that Ari Aster did. Um, so, I guess I didn't learn my lesson. I will definitely do that again. I will certainly like watch a movie, dislike it, and then never want anything to do with the director or a certain actor again. I will probably always do that. That'll always be my way. But oh my god, yeah. It's uh but I'll I'll when I do that, I'll think of this this scenario and I'll be like, okay, you know, maybe that is the essence of this podcast. So I appreciate that. Yeah. That being said, I will do the opposite of that and I will do stuff like the guy who did uh Under the Skin and Zone of Interest. Uh, Jonathan yeah. Glazer, I think is what his name is. I hate him. I hate him. I hate him so much. And yet I will keep watching his movies just to see if I'm wrong and then like raging out. So the other end of the spectrum, not much better. If we could only meet in the middle. <laughs> I didn't like Under the Skin. I think people only liked it because Scarlett Johansson was naked in it. Um, I think that's the only reason people like it. The the weird scenes where there's no ground, like the black area scenes, those are cool. Those are pretty cool. They're like 45 yeah. seconds of the entire fucking movie. I didn't see Zone of Interest yet. Don't. Um, I, I do love 
World War II films, and I, I, I have heard good things about it, but at the same point, like I heard it was just uh, a regular family drama that just happened to have a concentration camp and a backdrop. So I don't know. I think it's truly astounding for people who never once stopped to think like, Hey, did you know that the Nazis were real people? And so that like all those right. atrocities were real people. And I am yep. like constantly going to my therapist and being like, I don't know if I can live in this world. The evil is so prevalent and real. And so like, it's, it's not as much a movie yep. as it is like, yeah, I, pay, I normally pay my therapist to talk about this shit. You got how many people to pay you to film this? And it it, it kind of goes along the lines of two, like um, it, it seems like a lot of this stuff is outdated, but mm -hmm. I would actually say that like a lot of the rumors that revolved around Jewish people during World War II or right, right before mm -hmm. that they were like stealing children and bathing in their blood mm -hmm. are certainly things that we've now applied to Democrats in, in, in America. Oh, hilarious. Yeah, absolutely. With Pizzagate and shit like that. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's the same rumors that they spread about Jewish people, oh. like right, right before the Holocaust, and I don't like that information. <laughs> and like, and when you think about it, they they often say it about the Hollywood elites, and we know that all the Hollywood elites mm. are Jewish. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's just it it's I like watching those movies and thinking about like, oh well, you know, like oh, it's so great that we've evolved past this point, but then you realize that no, you haven't, and like you're just. You're just taking that thing and you're applying it to a different group of people mm -hmm. um, now, or actually in this case, the same people. And, and it's, it's kind of insane in that way. So there is certainly a, a case to be made that like, you're like, I don't know if I can live with all this evil in the world because the evil that's in the world is still the same evil that happened before. It's just now it's happening to different groups of people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a quality of being human. It is and almost incapable of getting rid of it. So I have an idea. Mm -hmm. What if we started a commune in Sweden? You've made it to the back end of the show. Now's the time for corrections, omissions, and deeper dives. In part one, Rocky could not remember the name of a recent and very popular movie that was basically a ripoff of an Are You Afraid of the Dark episode. It was Night Swim, and that was from this year, 2024, and it's by writer-director Bryce McGuire, who some of you might know as the writer of Baghead from 2023. Night Swim is a Blumhouse film and is about a former Major League Baseball player named Ray Waller who is forced into early retirement by a degenerative illness. He moves into a new home with his wife and their two children, one complete with a backyard swimming pool. However, a deep secret surfaces and unleashes a malevolent force that will drag the family into inescapable depths of terror. For those of you who don't know the cult classic Are You Afraid of the Dark, it was an early 1990s Nickelodeon show, kind of similar to the idea of The Pink Opaque, the show inside I Saw the TV Glow, as far as a low-budget show for young teens that was kind of like horror monster-themed. This, Are You Afraid of the Dark, was a horror anthology series, and much like that book, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, it really pushed the limit of what was considered to be maybe too scary to be aimed towards kids, which is really why I loved it so much and why it became such a, a cult classic. One such notorious episode for pushing the envelope was titled The Tale of the Dead Man's Float. In it was a truly burn-in-your-young-brain upsetting image of a zombie corpse that came out of an old pool. It's a pretty compelling argument to make that these are similar things. Um, if you look at the side-by-side -side image of the zombie in the corpse versus the monster in Night Swim, they bear a striking resemblance. Both have skeletal figures uh, with an exposed nose and, and the teeth very prominent, and they both have very predominant long, stringy hair. Both killers even stalk their victims around the pool before killing them. However, from a plot perspective, the tale of the dead man's float involves the main character discovering an abandoned pool in the basement of his high school, while the family at the center of Night Swim finds an abandoned pool that accompanies the new house that they bought. Both creatures prove capable of coming out of the water to attack their victims, which kind of elevates the story because, like, 
it's really exciting to see that even if you get out of the pool, you can still get attacked. Because if it was literally just like, hey, don't go in that pool, I think you would you you would be okay. You just wouldn't die. Just don't go in the damn pool. It's not that hard. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think the biggest difference between the two is that the... Um, I, it's, it's, it feels like a zombie. I, when articles, they talk about it as the monster, the villain, the evil creature. Um, it can possess you as well in Night Swim, which it can't in uh, the, the corpse, the tale of the dead man's float. Um, so, you know, that's a pretty big difference. So, if you talk to writer-director Bryce McGuire, he claims that this and the five-minute short film from 2014, which he made and based this on, were original and they were inspired by his life growing up. He said he was pretty inspired by like classic horror films such as The Poltergeist, uh, Jaws, and The Creature from the Black Lagoon, along with his own experiences as a child, because he grew up in Florida, where there's a real fear and reverence for the water, um, because there's so much water, and they've got lots of alligators and lakes and wetlands and like... You know, there's plenty of stories of alligators reaching out of wetlands and lakes nearby to grab small dogs and people. So it's like having something come out of a body of water to attack him feels like that's a Florida fear. That's a Florida anxiety. Now, I'm not here to say whether or not it it could or could not be true. In the Jingle All the Way episode, we talked about parallel discovery. So it's incredibly possible that these are just two really similar stories. However, there are really, really compelling and striking resemblances, and honestly, if I think about it, these are the only two pool monster zombie stories I can think of. Uh, If you are listening and you can think of any other, please, please let us know. I said Bridget Jones's Diary was based on Sense and Sensibility, but I remembered the Austin title wrong. Helen Fielding's 1996 novel Bridget Jones's Diary is loosely based on Jane Austen's 1813 novel Pride and Prejudice. I did get Mr. Darcy correct, but I remembered him from the wrong Jane Austen novel. Fielding has admitted that she stole the plot from Austen's novel. Like I said, she was pretty blatantly upfront about this. Uh, The novel was developed from Fielding's columns in The Independent and The Daily Telegraph, which are uh, British newspapers, and was written with the help of journalist Charles Leadbeater. That is a human's last name. (laughs) Leadbeater. What is the name of the actor who played the father in Beetlejuice? Jeffrey Jones played Charles Dietz, Lydia's father, in the Tim Burton 1988 film. You might also know him as most notably playing Emperor Joseph II in the 1984 Amadeus, and Ed Rooney, the principal, in the 1986 Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Um, Working with Burton, he would follow up Beetlejuice with Ed Wood in 94, and Sleepy Hollow in 1999. However... You might notice that despite appearing in the trailer for the sequel to Beetlejuice, 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 oh, fuck, (laughs) I've said it three times in a row. Anyway, despite that, he will not be in the film because, as Rocky alluded to, in 2002, he was arrested for possession of child porn, supposedly hiring a 14-year-old boy to pose for explicit photographs. As such, Jones faced a felony count of using a minor in an explicit film and a misdemeanor of possession of child pornography. Jones denied all accusations, saying, quote, All I want is for the truth to come out and for this matter to be resolved as quickly as possible. End quote. After pleading no contest, a statement made by a defendant in a criminal case where they neither admit nor deny the charges against them, but they agree to accept the punishment, this is like an alternative to pleading guilty or not guilty. Jones received five years probation and had to register as a sex offender, also being made to undergo counseling. Following the sentence, Jones said, This concludes a really painful chapter in my life, and I am sorry that this incident was allowed to occur. Such an event has never happened before, and it will never happen again. But troubles would continue to haunt the actor, as he would fail to update his sex offender status in Florida in 2004, and again fail to do so in California in 2010. He would receive uh, 250 hours of community service as a punishment for these failures. And that was pretty much the end of Jeffrey Jones's career. Well, 
pretty much, except that he definitely continued to act and was in a pretty predominant and successful show. You might remember him as playing the real-life newspaperman A.W. Merrick on Deadwood from HBO. That was in 2004 to 2006, so well after the 2002 charges. And then they would go on and make a reprisal of Deadwood, a movie, in 2019. Except that that movie came out right after the Me Too movement, and so his role was greatly reduced in that film. Did David Fincher direct Alien Resurrection? No. I was right. Resurrection is the fourth film in the Alien franchise, and it was directed by French director Jean-Pierre Jeunet, who you might know from Amelie or Delicatessen or City of Lost Children. Rocky was partially right in that it was the third film in the franchise that David Fincher directed. Uh, It's hard to remember what it was called because it was called Alien 3, but the three was stylized such that it should probably be read as alien to the third power. So the three is tiny and up above the N at the end of alien. Ugh, what a stupid idea. However, this film is important for a lot of reasons. It's Fincher's directorial feature-length debut, and it was also an epic mess of a production of film just to give you an idea, it would, it would go into filming without a finished script and already $7 million had been spent. What could go wrong? In fact, <laughs> its script would be rewritten seven times by nine different writers and originally started with a script that was by renowned cyberpunk author William Gibson, who you might know from Neuromancer or or Johnny Mnemonic. In fact, the script that 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 whole thing becomes wound up getting released as a comic series uh, to celebrate an anniversary of Alien later on, and because several people who got to read the script would all agree that that was a way better film than what they wound up filming. Uh, They wanted to take the whole franchise in a new direction because they didn't want to do the same thing as 1 and 2, which makes a lot of sense. And they really wanted to focus in on the duplicity of the Wayland yutani Corporation and why they were so intent in using the aliens as biological weapons. And so they would wind up settling on a, like, two-part story where the quote, underhanded Wayland yutani Corporation faces off with military aggressive culture of humans whose rigid socialistic ideas have caused them to be separated from Earth's society. Michael Bean's Corporal Hicks would be promoted to protagonist in that film, and Sigourney Weaver's character of Ellen Ripley would be reduced to a cameo appearance uh, before coming back in for the fourth installment in the franchise. An epic battle of alien warriors mass-produced by the expatriated Earthlings. Weaver liked the Cold War metaphor and agreed to a smaller role, partially due to dissatisfaction with Fox, which had removed scenes from aliens which were crucial to Ripley's backstory. Fox was skeptical about the entire idea, but they agreed to finance the development of the story and asked that the original writers Hill and Geiler attempt to at least get Ridley Scott, the director of two, to make three. They also asked that three and four be shot back to back to lessen production costs. Let me tell you why they did not wind up lessening any production costs. Scott was interested in returning for the franchise, but it didn't work out in his schedule. So they wound up, like, I think three different directors before winding up with Fincher. If you're finding this particularly interesting, go watch a fantastic documentary called Wreckage and Rage, The Making of Alien 3, directed by Charles D. Lazurica. I'm hoping that I am pronouncing that correctly which came out in 2003. It is an incredible deep look into everything that I'm talking about. I have barely scratched the surface. There are so many things that would wind up going totally tits up in the filming of this that it's amazing they came out with anything at all. So check it out. Super fascinating. If you're a fan of the franchise, if you're excited about Romulus coming out at the end of this month, get yourself together and, and watch that. 
What Marvel movie was Florence Pugh in? Rocky was right. She did debut her character Yelena Belova in Black Widow. She also winds up reprising that character in Hawkeye, Thunderbolts, Avengers Doomsday, and Avengers Secret Wars. What was the last film to feature an intermission in American theaters? Well, after reels were no longer needed, because that's why we had intermissions in the first place, it was to let the text switch the giant reel that the first half of the movie was on to the giant reel that the second half of the movie was on, because it was film, it was celluloid film. Now it's digital, and that's not necessary. However, theaters kept intermissions going to give audiences a break. You know, maybe they'll buy some more popcorn, some more candy. Who amongst us now in a two and a half hour movie hasn't thought, oh my god, would this be a good time to go to the bathroom? I'm hedging my bets here. Am I going to ruin or miss something by stepping out right now? Because I'm definitely not going to make it to the end if I don't go now. I even think that certain movies put in scenes that are like for going to the bathroom. They, they're they just boring, pointless scenes and the movie's three hours long, so they got to put something in there. Anyway, I digress. The reason they got rid of these intermissions after they were no longer definitely needed by the physical responsibilities of the tech switching the reels was because that they found out it was actually more cost-effective to jam more movies in during one day than to expect people to go out and buy more concessions during an intermission. So yeah, much like everything in our lives where why does this now suddenly suck when it didn't kind of used to, the answer is uh, capitalism. Yay. But I digress. Back to the main question. According to the San Francisco Gate, the last official movie to have an intermission in the United States was, a drumroll, Gandhi, in 1982. I swear to God. This movie is so notable, we're going to have to do a whole episode on it. However, I feel like we'll wind up accidentally doing a whole episode in the corrections and omissions, just accidentally. So, again, if you haven't seen Gandhi from 1982, get up on that. What is the name of the disease modern medicine believes is most likely the inspiration for stories of vampirism? Porphyria is a rare group of genetic blood disorders that affects the skin and nervous system and is sometimes called, quote, vampire disease. Some say that porphyria may have been what inspired the vampire myth. And I I really believe that this is true. There are very compelling reasons why. Porphyria patients suffer from sunlight sensitivity. Some types of porphyria, because there's more than one, it's a varied disease, cause skin symptoms when exposed to sunlight, such as blisters, redness, and swelling. This can lead to facial disfigurement, blackened skin, uh, and growth where the skin was affected, like hair growth. So you'd get this like disfigured face that would look like they were burning, but it is just an allergic reaction to the UV sun. You'll see this as a plot point in The Others, which is a really fantastic Nicole Kidman movie. I'm not really a big fan of Nicole Kidman. I don't know why I'm whispering this to you now, as if, like, someone's going to break into my house and be like, is she? Is she recommending a Nicole Kidman movie? Get the police in on that lady! But yes, check out that movie. It's good. Back to the topic. Also, porphyria people suffer from, and this is what I think is the most compelling reason for me, a deformity of their teeth. Repeated attacks of the disease can cause the gums to recede very intensely, and this makes teeth look like fangs. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, type in porphyria, P-O-R-P-H-Y-R-I-A, teeth, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It also causes people to kind of go bald. It makes people look like the Nosferatu character, which, by the way, who amongst us is not excited about that Eggers film coming out? I cannot wait. It looks like it is going to be fantastic. I digress yet again. People with porphyria have a different color urine. It can cause dark red urine, which folklore may have interpreted as drinking blood. You know, it goes in red, it it comes out red. 
they were not really bright back then. I think we can we can kind of just say. I have to issue a correction on the fact that I gave in part two about the, what I called at the time, Nabrock, because that is a word that I have seen but never heard, and I asked Google to pronounce it for me, and it is actually pronounced Nabro. The K is kind of silent, and the A makes a kind of Y thing. I was wrong. They never really existed. I, I, what I saw was a replica of a pair at the Museum of the Icelandic Sorcery and Witchcraft. Uh, I saw it online. Nybrok are a pair of pants made from the skin of a dead human, as opposed to a live human, I mean, that feels kind of redundant to say, which are believed in Icelandic witchcraft to be capable of producing an endless supply of money. Again. It is highly unlikely that these pants ever existed outside of folklore, so it's confusing that the Sorcery Museum has what they have labeled a replica, because you would expect it to be a, a reproduction of something that actually existed, but it is a replica of a, a, a concept of something that has never been proven to have existed. However, you can go online and see that replica and, and know what I know. It's fun. It's not great. Do it. Don't do it. Do it. Again, the folklore surrounding these pants were that they were like money pants or special money pants and that like anybody who had them would never run out of money. I think sometimes they're, they're, (laughs) they have a couple of funny different names. If I can remember, I know that money pants is one that I call them, but I definitely remember like money britches, dead man's pantaloons, uh, corpse britches, uh, and, and I think demon pants. That might just be a name of a punk band I like. (laughs) Necropants might be the probably most common one that I've heard people use when they don't want to say nabra. What is so interesting about the actual ritual for nebra is that it, it doesn't involve violence. I mean, it involves skinning a person, but it doesn't involve unvoluntarily killing a person. What actually happens is that first, you and a good friend, a very good friend, who might be roughly your size, make a pact that if either one of you die, the other one can use your corpse to make a pair of corpse bridges. Um, Once you die, the survivor digs up your body, flays the skin from the waist down, and, and tries super hard, like when you make that apple curly skin to like not make any holes you got to put the pants on uh right away uh because they have to like grow on you in order to activate them because they don't just come ready you also have to quote because i wouldn't just this wouldn't just come out of the, the depths of my mind steal a coin from a wretchedly poor widow the theft must be performed between the readings of the epistle and gospel during one of the three major festivals of the year. So basically between like Yule and Easter. Then you have to take the coin and um, <laughs> put it into the pockets. And you might be thinking, there are no pockets on this, Katie. It's a person's pants. Well, much like everything, you have to assume that we were never thinking about women when we talked about this. You were not invited. Um, So we're only talking about dude bottoms. You would put the coin in um, the scrotum. And then, you know, once you put your coin in your coin purse, the pantaloons would start collecting coins from the living and give them to the wearer um but you'd have to make sure you always kept that original coin in place that is like the thing that brings it to life well anyway you now know that too who is wearing mark's face when josh is attacked in his reddit ama ask me anything ariaster himself confirmed that it was oof when someone asked him that exact question. Just like Rocky thought. Good catch, Rocky. What was the name of Dexter's wife who he cheated on? It it wasn't Deb, right? 
Dexter Morgan's wife in the TV series and book series Dexter is Rita Bennett, her maiden name, also known as Rita Ann Morgan, her married name, and her middle name. She was created by Jeff Lindsay for the book series and appears in seven of the eight novels. In the TV series, which ran from 2006 to 2013, Julie Benz portrays Rita as a series regular in the first four seasons and as a special guest in the season five opener. What was the name of the actress who was in Vivitch as the mom and as Lisa Aaron Tully in Game of Thrones? Well, it was Scottish actress Katie Dickey. And I said that I didn't notice it was the same person, which kind of makes total sense, because she hadn't yet played Lisa Aaron in Game of Thrones, because that was a main character in season eight, which aired in 2019, whereas Vavitch came out four years earlier in 2015. So you'd be like way more likely to notice that the woman from Vavitch was in Game of Thrones than that the lady from Game of Thrones was in Vavitch, unless you saw it after the fact. And I only saw it that one time because I'm being a pain in the ass about seeing it again. And that is it for episode 18. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you had as much fun as I did talking to Rocky about Ari Aster and some modern horror. I hope that if you haven't seen Midsommar, you do decide to give it a chance or give it a second chance. This is the prime objective of our podcast, to get you to give things a go that maybe you weren't interested in trying before and Maybe you'll find yourself pleasantly surprised and deeply rewarded. I want to talk about one such case. In fact, I want to shout out to Sherry Prime, who I met through the Discord on Movie Night Extravaganza. They commented on our network episode saying that it caused them to watch the movie finally, and they very much adored it, which was, you know, very... Very, like, awesome to get to hear that people are listening to these episodes and it is affecting them in any kind of way where you then go and give a piece of art a chance. I want to thank them so much for reaching out and letting me know that they did do just that. It made Conan and I so freaking happy. Uh, We want to spread the word on that movie particularly. So thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, who tuned in and made it to the end of this episode. Do take a chance to look at the Trash Wire episode that I am on about the MPAA rating system and all of the Lord of the Rings goodiness that you can get from Movie Night Extravaganza. Other than that, it's been a pleasant episode. I look forward to joining you on our next one with Alexis Gentry as we cover another modern horror that I do really love and think is quite elevated, in my opinion, another horror mystery this time from 2014, with It Follows. This has been What If I Don't Like It? with your host, Katie Baldessaro. See you later, Space Cowboy.